Wow. Welcome to New Jersey. Uh, how many of you have only been to New Jersey in the sense that you watch The Sopranos on TV? <laughs> how many of you have watched The Sopranos on TV? Raise your hand. OK, that's real New Jersey. How many of you have been to New Jersey by virtue of having seen a Bruce Springsteen concert? <laughs> Nobody? Nobody's seen a Bruce Springsteen concert? One, two, three. Oh, come on. What? Oh, you don't have to see a New Jersey Springsteen concert. You can see him anywhere. I'm seeing him in Sweden this summer, we hope. Now, uh, yeah, Bruce is uh, feeling under the weather, so he was not able to come to Code for Lib. OK. <laughs> uh, that's enough of that. Uh, uh, got the community support volunteers. Good, good, good. Uh, the online community support volunteer is Mike Giarlo. Uh, want you to, yeah? From New Jersey. Who is from New Jersey, uh, apparently? Yeah, he is. <laughs> uh, raised questions with him on Slack. Um, and in, later in the afternoon, Eric Fetaplace will be uh, doing that. Um, have we decided how people uh, on, on, online are supposed to ask questions? Slack. On Slack? So uh, ask, ask your questions on Slack, and someone will relay them to this room. Is that right? Is there someone here who's going to do that? All right, we will ignore that. OK. All right, finally, uh, right. Um, so this conference wouldn't be possible without the work of uh, the local planning committee, who have done a great job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's thank these people. From Princeton University, Kate Lynch, who is a rock star. Esme Cowles, who is also a rock star. From the Princeton Theological Cemetery, Seminary. <laughs> I do that all the time, I'm sorry. Which is also in Princeton. Uh, that's Greg Murray. From the Rockefeller Archive Center, Hillel Arnold. And from Lehigh University, which is not in Princeton, Chuling Meng. There is a quiet room available upstairs on A floor. A floor, I believe, is the room just above us. Um, the class of 1952 room, that's the name of the room. All of these things have numbers attached to them. There is a class of 1981 hall on the other side of campus, if you want to go see. Right. Um, bathrooms. There are bathrooms on this floor to your left, to my left, to my left, to your right. OK. If you're going out to the left, as you leave the conference room and the men's room is sort of hidden behind a pillar. Uh, there is also a gender neutral restroom on the first floor of Frist, which is two flights up. Right. First floor, two flights up. Got that? Uh, lightning talk updates. There are still, at least there were, four slots left for the lightning talks. Um, as you heard this morning, these are fun. Uh, there are no tomatoes in the room, so don't worry. Uh, lightning talks will have slides, but will not, being, not be using the presenter notes because we saw what happened with that. Uh, lightning talks must be presented from the podium computer, which is right here. Uh, so when we break, you need to put any slides on this computer. And uh, we'll be using Zoom's screen share. I'm not sure what that means either. OK, um, so let's go to the talks. Uh, the first talk. Uh, is a live remote talk, which I presume means Zoom, uh, from Jackson Wong, uh, and is called Programmably, Programmatically 
assisted approaches to improving digital collections metadata. And there are, wow, hello. Test your sound, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yay, AV people. All right. Oh, and you have how much? You have 20 minutes. So should you want me to start now? Please start, yes. Excellent. Hello, uh, my name is Jackson Huang, uh, and I am the Digital Collections and Content Ingest Coordinator at the University of Michigan, though I'm based in California. Um, I'll be talking today about programmatically assisted approaches to improving digital collections metadata, and I want to emphasize here the term assisted. Our project is still very human time and labor intensive, with automation facilitating rather than replacing manual intervention. All right. Uh, so, sorry, give me a second to remember how to advance the slides. Okay. Okay. So, um, in this presentation, I'll be starting with some background on the approach we took with the overall project design. This project was both a pilot to test metadata assessment and remediation workflows for our digital collections more broadly, as well as an internship for master's students. Consequently, significant time and energy was spent on fleshing out values and principles that could be used for other projects and to make sure that the experience was educational and professional enriching for the students. I'll then be going into, oh, you can't see my slides. I'm sorry, that was my bad. Uh, give me one moment. Okay, let me see. It looks like you should be able to see my slides now. Now it's, okay, great, excellent. Sorry about that little hiccup. Um, so just as a review, I'll be starting with, you know, just an, an overview of the project. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit more about the specifics of one of the collections that we chose for our project. Uh, the collection is called the United States and its Territories, 1870 to 1925, the Age of Imperialism. I decided to focus this talk actually on one of the, uh, two pilot collections in particular instead of both of them because we were able to get a bit further in our process with that one and I think that'll allow me to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the particulars of the case. I'll then talk a little bit about what particular interventions we did for this particular collection and some issues we identified for ongoing and future work. Um, we approached our collections with the user's needs in mind and so we tried to understand the issues holistically even if particular fixes kind of fell out of the scope of metadata remediation more strictly. Um, we felt like it was important for us to know where we identified additional work that needed to be done, even if we couldn't do it right away um, as a part of advocating for the users and for the collection, especially since we're already putting time and energy into looking at that particular collection. Um, okay. Oh, looks like, give me a second. Uh, okay, so um, for... The, before I go too much into this particular project, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on our digital collections, uh, since this will give us some context for how the project came into being and for the particular decisions that we made. Um, so the first thing to note is that for us, we have a homegrown uh, digital collections backend. It's really flexible and it's really powerful, but it was also started in the late 90s. And so there are some quirks or features that make systematic metadata assessment or mediation a bit challenging. Uh, for example, for our text collections, we store the metadata for each collection in a separate XML file rather than in a database. So it makes cross collection comparisons tedious. Uh, we are currently in the process of designing a new digital collections platform um, and migrating from the old system, which I think has provided us a really good opportunity to shift our priorities um, from production to assist assessment to, you know, we want to have as few workarounds as possible migrating into the new system. And it's kind of a natural opportunity to re-examine and reimagine some of our existing workflows. I want to know also that this work was made possible by funding that we received for additional assistance by graduate interns. And I wanna emphasize here again, the word assistance, not to downplay the labor or the contributions of our student workers, but because I think in the same way that I use programmatically assisted to kind of create space for the fact that significant human labor is still required. Um, it's felt really important for me to be clear that while the work is collaborative, designing an educational experience for students and also creating 
process changes into operational workflows needs to be led by permanent staff for these kinds of efforts to be sustainable on an organizational level. Um, and this requires obviously significant time and effort. Uh, so for our particular project, we wanted to look for a collection that was older but heavily used. And so this kind of indicates that it's likely to have metadata issues in the sense that maybe the our standards a little bit different when it was created and it would really benefit from attention and intervention because of how heavily used it is. Um, so this particular collection that we chose is called the United States and its territories, which I'll get a little bit more uh, into detail for. Um, there, my slides are also available in the OSF for Code for Lib. Um, so if you want to take a look at the particular links that are shared, um, you'll be able to do so, I guess right now or after the presentation. Um, so something that we started with was that actually before we went into the metadata itself, we actually spent some significant time uh, on some readings to get not just technical foundations, but also conceptual groundings on colonialism and reparative approaches. Uh, I think it felt really important for us if we we're looking at a colonial collection to kind of understand a little bit more, not just about the history of U.S. colonialism, but this is a collection, as I'll go into, that focuses on the Philippines. And so U of M has kind of a particular colonial relationship with the Philippines because of a variety of alum and people who are associated with the university being associated with the colonial administration in the Philippines. And so I felt it was really important to kind of create the space for us to understand that a little bit more before we tried to look at particular interventions. I think similarly, we read um, like certain articles like decolonization is not a metaphor because I think it felt like if we we're going to engage in uh, with colonial materials, we need to understand some decolonial and other reparative approaches. Um, we actually compiled a resource list as part of this, which is linked at the end of the slides. For those of you who are interested, it's a combination of um, kind of metadata stuff, but also a lot of different kind of critical metadata projects that we were inspired by for this project. Um, I want to shout out to uh, the reparative archival description project template that was created by Jessica Tai. Um, she actually did a workshop on it at uh, the last DLF, um, and we used that project plan kind of template for our project. Um, and then I think something else to note is that we decided to take this approach to use automation to identify areas that require manual attention. And so automation here, it facilitates rather than replaces human intervention. And so we really thought about ways that automation could kind of make us more efficient in our um, interventions, but it wouldn't necessarily replace the need for uh, human effort. So this is a screenshot of the homepage of the collection. Um, so this collection is called the United States and its Territories, 1870 to 1925, the Age of Imperialism. And it consists of about 4,000 or so texts that are focused on the Philippines under U.S. occupation. Um, it was originally uh, funded with money from the NEH for digitization, um, and it was launched in 2005. Uh, it does actually have a variety of materials, not just from the Philippines, which I'll get a little bit into in uh, what we found out when we were doing our assessment. Um, and for the most part, these are materials that are cataloged in our stacks. And so we pulled the metadata from the catalog records uh, and the materials were also OCR'd with full text and images available in the digital collection, as well as in Hottie Trust. Um, so something that we really wanted to do in our metadata assessment is think about user needs. Uh, I think that for metadata efforts, it can be easy to uh, like it can be easy to get kind of focused on making sure the metadata is right. And I think it can be a little bit more difficult to think about how metadata intersects with user needs more broadly. And so we wanted before we started to actually dig into the metadata just to look a little bit at the analytics for this particular collection. And so something that we noted is that the vast majority of the users for this collection are from the Philippines. That users from the Philippines make up only about seven and a half percent of our total users across all of our digital collections but that they account for over 80% of the users for this particular collection. Um, so this is a image from 2022 for the total usage for this collection in 2022. And you can see that almost uh, 350,000 uses use, uh, sessions were logged from the Philippines in 2022. Um, and this makes sense uh, because this is not just a collection of materials about the Philippines, it is a collection of materials 
that are largely in Filipino languages. Um, and something that we noticed is that the most heavily used texts are in Filipino languages, and, a variety, and uh, several of them were actually dictionaries um, that are used for kind of language classes uh, in the Philippines. Um, and so the interventions that we kind of chose that we ended up uh, doing for this particular collection um, were, were to identify the kind of best version of the metadata between the catalog and the digital collection, to verify and update uh, language metadata, to improve the organization of materials for search and browse. And then, like I had kind of alluded to earlier, we felt like it was important to write down or to record um, certain areas for future intervention that we had kind of identified through the course of our investigation. Um, so the first kind of major thing that we did was actually just to try to identify the most robust current metadata that we had. Uh, so as I mentioned, the digital collections metadata had been imported from the catalog, but there were actually a lot of discrepancies between the metadata in uh, the catalog and in our digital collections. So this is kind of for a variety of reasons that I would say boil down to the fact that it was created a long time ago. Um, so for example, when we scanned the materials back in 20, 2003, some of the materials weren't in the ILS yet, and so they were given a provisional record at the time, or the digital collection record is kind of just a stub. Um, and then there are some materials where the catalog records had been updated since the original metadata import. During the pandemic, our institution went through some major metadata revisions uh, since there was kind of work that people could do remotely. Um, and so some of the catalog records had been enhanced since 2005. Um, and then in addition, uh, I think because some of the materials had been only minimally cataloged initially, there were also a variety of digital collections records that had kind of more robust metadata. And so we kind of went through this effort to identify what the most complete metadata we had was for each particular item um, so that we could make sure that all of those sources were updated for consistency. So if there was more metadata in the uh, ILS that we could import that catalog record into the digital collection and then similarly figuring out how to do the same vice versa. Um, and then I think that another major intervention that we did was just um, looking at the language metadata. Um, so something that we noted was that while the materials were heavily used in the Philippines, both access platforms, so our digital collections and Hadi Trust are completely in English. Uh, and so we wanted to note that uh, kind of an option to filter by language would potentially be helpful for users being able to identify relevant material. Um, and so we kind of looked at, and so and so we felt like um, being able to filter by material was useful for the users from a kind of um, identification of relevant material standpoint, but I think that we felt that it would also potentially be useful for some future assessment. Um, for example, seeing if OCR quality or indexing varied between languages uh, because you know, even it, though most Filipino languages are written in, in Latin script, um, we weren't sure if the tokenization or whatever other um, normalization happened for the indexing worked well in those languages or if our systems were correctly identifying them as the particular languages they were. Um, and so kind of one of the major interventions that we did is that we noticed that a lot of the materials were identified with the MARC uh, language code MAP, which is for Austronesian Other. And so we tried to update uh, those with specific Recording language in progress. Specific codes. Um, so for example, uh, Cebuano, Tigayan, Ilocano. So we didn't want it to have this kind of general language when there was a more specific case. Um, I think also there is a collective language code PHI for languages of the Philippines for smaller languages like Ivanag and Tiure which don't have a specific mark code, but you know it can be specified to be from the Philippines. Um, and so how we did that is that, because um, we are all not, none of me or the two interns are experts in Filipino languages, um, we tried to you know flag cases that needed intervention, and then we compared the language codes against the subject terms or in the text where possible. Um, and we also do have catalogers, so we were able to reach out when we were really not sure. Um,
And then uh, the last kind of major intervention that we did was um, improving the organization of the collection. So as I noted before, uh, the collection centers the Philippines, but it isn't actually exclusively Filipino material. Um, and I think that something that we noticed was that thinking about the fact that users were mostly from the Philippines, but the framing of the collection kind of centers the United States, um, that because there's not really an organization of place, it centers the kind of colonial relationship to the U.S. in a way that isn't necessarily the most useful to users. Um, I think if users from a particular place want to look for materials about their country, uh, it would be more helpful to kind of be able to organize it in that way. Um, and something that we noted here as well is that uh, this was kind of something that was known when the collection was created, because if you go into the tip section, um, you can see that it says that if you want to limit books, limit searches to books of the Philippines, you can do this kind of trick in the advanced search feature. And so um, we kind of looked at the materials and we identified a kind of clear set of browse or kind of search categories. So aside from the Philippines, um, there are also materials about Guam, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Virgin Islands, Indonesia, Polynesia, and other kind of Latin American countries. Um, and so we identified that. And then as a kind of for later fix, um, we realized that it would probably also make it much easier uh, for people to access that if there was kind of more explanation or we remove this kind of tip about how to browse by area out of the tip section into the main text. Um, and so then, uh, like I said, uh, there were kind of a bunch of things that came up as we were examining the collection that we felt like were important, but we didn't necessarily have the capacity for. But I wanted to mention it because um, we want to work on these, and I think it's also kind of keeping in mind those future fixes instead of trying to find them again later, uh, we found to be a really useful approach. Um, so one of the things that we noticed is that like I had mentioned, people oftentimes use the dictionaries, um, but they have they were using the view full text function to use the view, view the full OCR output and then using control F to search within the text instead of using the, um, we have like a search within the text kind of function at the top of each website or top of each page. Um, but I guess it's a little bit difficult to see. And so I think something that we noticed was that something that would be really useful is just making it clear that the search within text is a function that we have. Um, I think something else, yep, like I alluded to, was just that uh, it would be helpful on the landing page to kind of have some more explanation for the user of how the material is organized and how to find materials. Um, in fact, something that we noticed is that the collection was um, highlighted on a collection of Filipino primary source documents for teachers, but the note about our particular digital collection was that the organization was confusing, right? And so that's that's not really what you want for your collection. And I think, again, like these are really valuable primary source materials and they're used in the Philippines, but kind of the interface we noticed was a barrier to use. Um, something else that we noted with the discrepancies between our digital collection and our catalog metadata is that it would be good to kind of have some kind of consistent workflow for periodic refreshes of imported metadata. And so in general, we can uh, pull metadata in again, but we don't tend to do it unless a stakeholder uh, lets us know that there need to be updates. And so we talked a little bit about um, just building that into our workflow for the future. And then I think this is an area that um, I'd really like to look into more, which is just uh, kind of disaggregating the OCR data. Um, and so potentially identifying materials with low confidence intervals or even certain scripts or languages that we've noticed tend to have poor OCR quality to maybe re-OCR at a set period of time or even just to like kind of examine to see if the OCR has improved for that language, maybe if something like Tesseract has like a package for that particular language now. And so just kind of disaggregating a bit um, the data that we have and making sure that the OCR is functioning well across languages, which I think is especially important um, for materials like this, where the interface is in English. And so really being able to do robust full text searching in the original language is going to be useful for the users. Um, so thank you all for your time. Um, 
we are happy to hear from you if you have any questions about it. Um, I'm in Slack and I've put my email here as well, as well as the emails of my two uh, graduate interns, Gregory McCollum and Curtis Hunt. Uh, we also uh, did a, it's not fully completed, but we have a write-up of kind of the report of the project, a GitHub repo of uh, the coding that the code that we used for the different analysis, and then some resources. So like I said, uh, this, uh, our slides are up in OSF, um, so feel free to check them out. And like I said, I'm in Slack, so feel free to send any questions there. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. I believe we don't have time. We don't have time for questions. Uh, leave your questions in the Slack, and Jackson is there to answer. They joined just now. Great. All right. Let's see if we can get back. Oh. Vincent Stanley, I need your password. <laughs> okay, we have a time for a question. What's con what's control F? I don't know. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> right. Next, we have a ten minute talk in person from Tyler Nathaniel Wade on test driven migration. <laughs> Tyler. Where's Tyler? Yes. All right. Well, I have here. I have this. Okay, I'll move it to the other screen. All right, and I'm going to make it big. There. How's that? Yes, sir. Put this, can we put in a slash? Oh, no. If you know how to do it, you can do it. <laughs> yep. Here we go right here. Oh, no. <laughs> here we go. All right? Yep. Uh, you can move this or what? Can y'all hear me fine? Or can y'all hear me fine? Cool. <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Or good afternoon. Um, oh, sorry. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a little nervous right now. If I start talking really fast or you can't understand me, please just yell, say, Tyler, slow down. Okay? So my name is Tyler Wade. Um, I am the Cataloger and Metadata Services Fellow, but I also work very, very closely with the Research Data and Scholarship Services Software Development Team. <clears throat> so today, I'm gonna to talk about a research data migration project that my colleagues and I have been working very hard on here at Princeton University. Uh, we are migrating our current institutional repository called Dataspace which is powered by DSpace software to a new locally developed repository. During this migration, <clears throat> we are also converting all the metadata schemas from modified Dublin Core to Datasite. We are also improving the discovery and reuse of our research data by approving upon our FAIR guiding principles <clears throat> for research data discoverability, and FAIR meaning findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So for this project, my focus has been on the metadata migration. We decided to move from modified Dublin Core to the Datasite metadata schema because Datasite is specifically designed to describe scientific research data sets. When my team at Princeton University Library set out to write a data site cataloging interface, we knew that we did not want to recreate all of the complexity of Fabrica, which is the data site cataloging interface on datasite.org. However, we did not know exactly what fields we would need to handle our legacy content. I was asked to write RSpec system tests that would mimic a cataloger describing these works in our new system. <clears throat> Test-driven development is a technique where we write the test first. In our case, this could be called behavior-driven de development. I write automated tests that will mimic the behavior of a cataloger who was describing a research data set. The test drives the, the development, usually by uncovering places where our local data site cataloging interface is missing a metadata field or otherwise not behaving as expected. 
Another technique from agile software methodology that we use is often called the bullet tracer approach. However, we really don't like bullets. <laughs> and so we don't like to use this metaphor. <laughs> We, we, <clears throat> excuse me. we prefer to call this the trail marker pattern. Imagine you are trying to build a hiking trail through the woods. You have a budget, you have a timeline. The first thing you should do is walk all the way from the beginning of the trail to the end of the trail and figure out where are all the difficult spots going to be. <clears throat> if you need to build a bridge over a river, for example, you'll want to find that out at the beginning of the project not at the end of the project after you might be out of budget and out of time. It isn't that we will not encounter any problems, but the idea is to surface problems early while there is still time to deal with them or if necessary, make a new plan. In our case, before we migrate 340 legacy data sets, we need to first see if we can move a small representative sample of data sets all the way from the start to the finish. The tests that I write are the equivalent of walking the trail from start to finish. We worked with stakeholders to identify a variety of use cases. For, for example, records with many authors and ORCID IDs, records with really huge data needs, records with many thousands of files, and records with many funders. This gives us an opportunity to ensure the system will behave correctly under all of these circumstances. Our goal is to find and fix bugs before they affect our users. <clears throat> this is our starting point, the beginning of the trail. This is a data set stored in DSpace and described with modified Dublin Core, which causes unevenly described records that do not easily adhere to the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. For example, the description of of, of these records predate the use of ORCID identifiers for authors. Our goal is to have all of these records findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is going to take a while, but a good first step is to re-describe them all in data site. Augment them with identifiers such as ORCID IDs, DOIs, and ROR's. We are also moving the data to modern storage and enabling new ways of downloading it. This is our end point, the end of the trail. This is the same record after it has been redescribed and migrated, reviewed by our data curators, and published in our Research Data Commons Discovery Portal, which is called Princeton Data Commons Discovery. This is what the software tests look like when I'm writing them. These are written in RSpec, which is a Ruby testing framework. These are specifically system specs which use a, excuse me, which use a domain specific language called Capybara, which actually drives a web browser. This allows us <clears throat> to test all of the interactions on the website, in including any JavaScript functionality. You can see the title, description, and other fields being declared here. And here you can see an example of what it looks like to drive a browser window with Capybara. For example, to fill in a text box, you use a fill in command. To, to, to click on a button, you use the click on command. I was a little intimidated at first when I was looking at these tests, because you know, code looks crazy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but however, uh, once I started to actually do the test, um, to actually write it, the, it, it became a little self or more self-explanatory. So this is what the test will look like when I run it. So as you can see, that, that is the, oh, sorry, sorry, y'all. So uh, as you can see, that was the, my command prompt. I'm about to run the test. And as you can see, it's pretty cool. Everything is filling in by itself. The, <clears throat> the test is driving the web browser. And at the end, we have this very nice looking show page. 
You can see we have our DOIs. We have our a very nice and well formatted description. We have our arcs. We have our funders. And the funders are usually, like a lot of times, it's like an organization, so we use RORs for the funders. And overall, I think it's pretty cool, right? <clears throat> <laughs> Here we go. Okay, and so our tests can also load data into our development and staging environments. This gives our software developers and stakeholders a chance to, to evaluate the software with real data so we can judge whether, whether well, excuse me, so we can judge whether it is yet good enough to, to support what we need to do. <clears throat> we are finding bugs, and that is proof that the system is really working. <laughs> And so, for example, uh, none of the random data our developers entered had more than one is cited by value. So we didn't find this display bug until we looked at the interface with real data in it. And in conclusion, this technique is really cool and is working really well for us. Uh, the software is mostly developed at this point. And now that we have achieved our goal of testing it with a representative sample, I can now start working on migrating the test of these legacy objects. And my name is Tyler Wade. Um, if you see me around Cofalia, please ask me any kind of questions that you would like to ask me. Um, like I said, it's my first time here, so I'm enjoying the experience. <laughs> <laughs> So, Tyler, you win the prize for showing the first instance of code at Code for Lib <laughs> and the first live demo at Code for Lib. So, your prize is. <laughs> All right, I have a question. Y yes, sir. So, the one thing missing is like the subscripts on the magnesium silicate. Is oh, that ever going to happen? <laughs> that may not happen. <laughs> Any other questions? We have time for one more. All right. Okay. Super, super, super. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, different screen, okay. You get to see my script. All right. All right, so the next talk is a 20 minute hybrid talk, which I assume means Zoom, from Julie Shi and Mike Nason called Metadata for Everyone, Identifying Metadata Quality Issues Across Cultures. Uh, are we gonna just, is that gonna just appear on the screen? Yes? No? It's pre recorded. It's pre recorded. That's what you call hybrid? Oh, great, great. So, okay, so that's probably in this thing. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oops. Which one is it? Oh, Mike Mason? Okay. Whoops, let's move this one back. No? You want to do it? <laughs> Please do it. Please do it. But it sort of was, this is like, I'm a, I don't know, you have to. Option tab. Option tab. Option tab is Thank not, Carrie. not helping me. <laughs> no, 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 don't do your, you'll like, you don't want to switch tabs, you want to uh, move this window over there, but we have to, like, get rid of this yeah, window here. Option. Option tab? Command tab. Oh, okay. All right, and we, have, we have, oh, so then we should, this thing, <laughs> this thing, <laughs> I want 
to I want to shrink this. I want to escape. Don't lose my tabs. Do not lose my tabs. Uh, there you go. Right. Now, now you can move this one over. And, oh, we want this, what, what, this one we want here? this one here? want this one there. Is this to the left? There we yeah. Go. All right. Oh, Macintosh. Macintosh! Yeah. All right. All right. Have fun. Oh, it's a, it's just a Greetings to folks in Princeton, New Jersey for Code for Lib. Uh, regrettably, I could not attend this year, uh, but instead you're going to get to hear from Julie, who is better and nicer than me in almost every way anyway. So that's the great for you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Metadata for Everyone project that we've been working on together, a joint project between PKP and Crossref, uh, and, and what the context of that project is, and a little bit of introduction about myself and, and what's kind of been going on. So, uh, hi. I'm the Open Scholarship and Publishing Librarian at what to most of you would be a pretty small school in Atlanta, Canada, the University of New Brunswick. My job, like so many of us exhausted people, is to help make the research that happens at my institution as available to the public as possible. I also work for the Public Knowledge Project, PKP, as a member of their publishing services team where I'm the cross and metadata liaison. I ended up in that role because I have a lot of opinions. Like a lot of people with abundant opinions, I look like this. I am a white cis settler from the unceded stolen territory of the Mi'kmaq Wallistiquay peoples, just a short hop from the Wallistook River, a much cooler name than the Settler Crown St. John River, if you ask me. That river is up here, it's next to Maine, a state you rarely think about unless you are mad at Senator Susan Collins. Susan Collins is exceptionally great at finding excuses for you to be mad at her, and so you have many reasons to know where roughly she is from. I have been yelling about metadata for what feels like my entire career. If you know me, and I think there's a few people in the room who may, uh, you may also just say that I have been yelling for my entire career. Uh, I started off as library staff from 2005 to 2012, uh, working in a library publishing program doing XML typesetting and managing a multi-journal OJS install. In 2013, I made it official and became a librarian and was lucky to become the Skullcoms repository sort of responsibilities as needed librarian at the same institution managing a fresh repository migration. Uh, then, embracing my uh, millennial generational birthright to a side hustle, I've also been working for PKP since 2014, where I help hosted clients and make passive-aggressive GitHub issues for metadata-related problems, and I work closely with Crossref. In general, academic publishing is kind of my whole thing. Were I smart, I would diversify. I'm going to talk about some of the themes uh, that are wrapped around this project. Uh, and things that sort of motivated us to engage in this project in the first place. Number one, of course, metadata is important. This is unsurprising. We know metadata is important. It's the major thing we're pushing in open scholarly infrastructure. It's, it's, the, it's the key to people making arguments about tenure and promotion and funding and saving time and all these other things. Meta metadata, is a, it's a big deal. Metadata is also often overlooked. Uh, I think a lot of people assume metadata happens kind of automatically. Uh, administrators in particular just kind of assume that all of this stuff is out there and they can give them things that matter and mean actual things. And, you know, your H indexes and your variety of, like, we have all this information. We can just get, you know, whatever, whatever kind of information we want. And so in this way, metadata is kind of overlooked. People don't really pay enough attention to it to understand the complexities and the problems and the limitations. Uh, that we face in the metadata space in academic publishing. Metadata is also a bit of a formality, I think, in a lot of cases of researchers or authors filling out a form about your submission that has metadata in it. It's probably one of the last things you do before you submit, and it probably means a lot less to you than the submission itself does. Uh, so it's not too surprising that it's treated a little bit like a formality. Uh, metadata is neither sexy nor fun. Uh, it's maybe a bit of a rude awakening to those of us who are wonks or nerds or have enormous discogs collections, but metadata itself is not really a fun time. And I think for a lot of people, being told that your metadata needs to be better is a little bit like being told you need to stretch before you go for a walk or you need to drink so many glasses of water a day or whatever else. It is important, uh, but it's also kind of an easily ignorable thing uh, that nerds worry about. Um, metadata is labor. Uh, this is something we don't necessarily think about all the time, but when we talk about metadata being better or more complete or more exacting, somebody has to do that work, and that work is real labor, uh, and for some people, it is more labor than for others. Um, 
speaking of more labor, our metadata is very generally Anglo-centric. Uh, English is a primary selector for indexing in Scopus and in lots of other places. And uh, the things that we expect don't necessarily map to other cultures. And for those reasons, metadata is not, in fact, for everyone. Uh, metadata is predominantly, the standards that we use are predominantly based around North America and Europe and sort of Western ideas, uh, scholarship, this sort of stuff, uh, long-standing citation formats, and a lot of entrenched cultural norms. We'll talk a little bit about the project itself. Uh, in the summer of 2021, Crosshair put on a, an RFP on the reach and effects of metadata, and it included this piece. It seems logical and very widely accepted that more and better metadata leads to good things. Does it? And I think that's kind of the bigger, the biggest part of the question that we wanted to answer here. Does it? We knew from years of working with multilingual journals that more and better metadata was both a non-trivial priority and a significant amount of work for many journals. We knew that the downstream effects of metadata weren't well understood across a great deal of our users. We knew that multilingual metadata comes with a huge volume of caveats. Uh, we knew that there's a rift between perceived need to translate metadata and its actual value for journals. So people were translating content that may or may not have been being indexed in the places they thought it was being indexed in or being treated by specific schema in a certain way. And we also knew that a lot of users conflate UX and design with metadata, that they were putting things in uh, metadata fields so they would appear on a website, not necessarily so they would actually record the metadata that was important or accurate for any of these things. We knew that OJS and other systems like it can often force users to put square pegs into round holes, places where either a field that they felt was necessary was missing or a place where the information that was being asked for was unclear to the users and they were putting something in there that they thought was the right thing. Systems can fail users by asserting meaning that isn't culturally appropriate or relevant. A good example of this is the nation or country field. In Canada, we've been having a lot of discourse around indigenous sovereignty and indigenous lands and our relationships with them. And if I were, say, from the Wollastook region, which I am, I could not select Wollastook as a country from the drop-down list because that list is an ISO standard and does not include indigenous nations. So that sucks. And then also we have all this legacy and baggage of print media, which to me is a bit of an unkillable ghost. People caring about stuff as it's supposed to appear in a table of contents, which nobody looks at really, and isn't represented the same way on a website as it would be represented in print. Uh, so a lot of these legacies and baggage related to that. So we proposed to Crossref the following, the discovery phase, we'd work with Crossref to establish scope, priorities, and identify data sources, predominantly a great big hunk and pull from their API. We place an emphasis not just on broadly accepted best practices for journal publishing and indexing, but also emphasis on equity, diversity, and inclusion, like indigenous place names, non-Western naming conventions, and multilingualism. The first phase was setting up the data set and performing manual review to develop a typology of the issues found across selected sources, as well as developing heuristics that may be used to automatically detect issues. That is the bulk of what Julie will be talking about coming up. And then phase two, Quantifying completeness, inconsistencies, and idiosyncrasies found in metadata as they pertain to identified issues, documenting those found issues, and algorithmically identifying multilingual issues, as well as common name metadata problems. So here's Julie to talk in more detail about the work and her experience in it. She did a great job, and I'm very excited for you guys to hear all the things she has to talk about. Uh, thanks so much for having us, and I hope to see people in real life sometime when I, I'm not terrified of getting on an airplane. See ya. Microphone is not on. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, which one is mine? Go through all of them. That is not mine. Oops. 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 Am I on the wrong desktop? <laughs> oh. Thank you. Yes, that is mine. Oh, and here we go. Okay. All right. I Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. So as Mike said, I will be getting into the nitty-gritty of phase 1, um discussing our methods and findings. Um and these slides are available at osf.io forward slash pbzny. That's all lowercase if you'd like to follow along on your own devices. 
Uh, but first, just a quick introduction. My name is Julie, and this is also my first conference. Um, so <laughs> um, I will also probably be talking quite fast. <laughs> Um, but I came to this project in my last semester of library school because I had lots of questions about metadata, and I thought I could find some answers here, but it turns out that I just got more questions. Uh, and more recently, I am, uh, started as the Digital Preservation Librarian at Scholars Portal, which provides technical services to university libraries in Ontario and increasingly to organizations across Canada. I am also a settler living and working on the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape. In acknowledging these lands and nations, I want to recognize that libraries do not exist in a temporal, social, or political vacuum. And neither do the metadata and scholarly publishing infrastructure that we build and use and maintain in our daily work. Instead, libraries operate on indigenous lands. And too often, we create and use standards and tools that are in tension with and hostile to indigenous and non-Western knowledge systems. So holding these observations in one hand, I ask that you hold a few questions in the other. Starting broadly, how do our systems and standards invisibilize communities, worldviews, and stories? And zooming in on metadata, when is non-compliance with a standard due to poor practice? And when is it a conscious political act? How can we tell, and how can we help? Returning to the project now, how do we figure out who metadata is not for? One approach is to view metadata quality as a multi-dimensional concept instead of as a measure of human and machine usability or technical conformance. In this framing, what does good or bad quality look like? We follow the lead of Naomi Shiraishi, who considers metadata in name authority records to be of accurate and high quality only if it does not forcibly out or harm the person in the record. So bringing this all together for this project, we define cultural quality issues as issues that impact or have the potential to impact the representation of identities, roles, intentions, and other factors specific to social, regional, or research culture. In other words, who is being harmed by our systems and standards, and how are they pushing back? To unpack these questions, I return to my literature roots to close read the records. And for those less familiar with the humanities, close reading means digging into the ins and outs of a text to tease out the different layers of meaning. But metadata records aren't your average literary text. So where does one begin? Taking a leaf out of Marcia Zong and Jin Chen's book, I began by comparing the metadata record to its original item, so in this case, the PDFs. And this translated to doing an initial read through of the record to pull out clear issues and note questions and possible other issues. And then going back and forth between the record and the PDF to compare the values available in each, identify more issues, run into more questions, and note more potential other issues. If I noticed a difference in information that was displayed on the item's landing page, that would also get thrown into the mix. And so I would go back and forth and back and forth until I couldn't take it anymore. And after I got the hang of things, I capped it at about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And during this process, if a light bulb went off, I would circle back to previous records that I had noted similar issues for to see if I could find a pattern or if it just seemed like a widespread uh, poor metadata practice, such as copy-pasting text into a metadata field, which can result in things like footnote markers appearing in the record. And really, how bad can it be? Before you rejoice with me and my inner metadata and literature nerds, uh, here's some context. The sample includes 427 records from various publishers and publishing platforms. And a chunk of these records are specifically from OJ, uh, OJS Publications, since is the, this is the publishing software that PKP develops. And so given the sample size, it turns out it can be kind of bad. There's so much information contained in a single record in PDF, so I had to figure out where exactly to focus my efforts. After a first pass, looking at every seventh record for a total of 61 records um, to figure out which fields to look in and what types of issues I might expect, I found relevant issues occurring most often in the abstract and title field for items, given in family name, as well as affiliation for people, and publisher, title, language, and subject for uh, containers, which is usually a journal. So how well did our text hold up? No spoilers, but not super well. Uh, after recording my results in a spreadsheet, and I apologize for this screenshot as well as the next one, um, I found across the board of 427 records and the nine metadata fields that I mentioned before that there were 3,566 cultural issues across 30 issue types. And eight issues stand out for having over 200 instances each. So four of them, value absent, publisher location absent, affiliation absent for all authors, and incorrectly input, can be found in records for all content types. And the other four, language attribute absent, name style absent for author names, um, value in original language absent, and translation absent, are specific to records that could have values in more than one language or script. So articles that provide titles, abstracts, and author information in multiple languages, for example. 
And you might have noticed that seven of these eight issues refer to absences. Um, in the issues that I found, these absences make up 75% of all of them. In other words, there is a glaring presence of absence. So we know that these issues exist and we know that their presence is significant, but what exactly is at stake here? To understand the significance of the issue types that I found, I distilled a typology of five buckets. And since these are conceptual groupings and because I think more is less when it comes to describing and contextualizing things, issue types can and often do fall under more than one umbrella. And just to go through these umbrellas quickly, starting with language, this refers to the languages and scripts of values and their identification using language and style attributes. And, that, and this applies to all elements. So some issues include the value in the or original language or the language attribute being missing from the record. Next up is naming, which speaks to how individual and organizational names are recorded and whether that's in accordance with linguistic and cultural conventions. And issues might look like multi-part family names like Vandenberg or De Silva being split across the family and given name fields. For organizations, uh, an issue might relate to the use of acronyms. Moving on to seniority, this refers to stylistic and content-based interventions that attempt to reflect the seniority of certain authors. So this can involve entering a professional title like doctor or professor in the given name field or listing all authors as first. Geography, as it suggests, applies to values that document geographic locations. So mostly affiliation and publisher fields. Um, and these locations can gesture to social, cultural, and linguistic positions, which is why it's a separate bucket here. And last but not least, contribution, which refers to the acknowledgement of individuals, communities, uh, and organizations that contributed to the creation and publication of an item. So the basic contributors would be the authors and publishers, but there's also research funders, editors, peer reviewers, rights holders, and the like. And to give you a more concrete sense of what this process might look like, um, these next few slides will be a bit overwhelming. Um, this first example case includes issues that fall in the language and naming buckets. So the full text for this article is in Persian, but the title, abstract, author name, and affiliations, container title, and even the issue and volume number are provided in the PDF in English and Persian. Yet the record gives only English translations and romanizations. So the values in Persian are absent, as are the author's affiliations. And this raises questions. Why is the Persian absent? What if the romanized names are their preferred names? What if these are their only names? Or what if these are not originally Persian names, and the names in Persian script are actually transliterations of the romanized form, which is potentially itself a transliteration? The next example concerns language naming and contribution, where a conference proceeding that is only available in Japanese has a record that includes Japanese, Romanized Japanese, and English translation. In detail, the publisher name and container title are not given in Japanese script. The container title field contains values in Romanized Japanese and translated English in a single field, and no English translation is given for the item title. All of this makes the container language, which is set to EN or English, inaccurate. And this record is also missing the author's name, which falls under naming and contribution. And in this case, the English landing page also comes into play, since only placeholder text reading in Japanese is given for the item title and author. So for more questions with no clear answers, why is the publisher's name in English, the container title in translation and transliteration, and the item title in Japanese script? And is this reason related to why the language code is set to EN? And what was the desired impact of this mix of languages? Um, and what is the actual effect? And in the user interface, is the placeholder text related to the author's absence from the record? And how does this absence impact the representation of the author's identity and work? And looking more closely at author name fields, this next example has issues spanning seniority, naming, geography, and language. In this case, we see in the PDF that author names on the left side are all in caps, while author names on the right are all regular case. Looking closer at the pair of author names that I've copied from the top row of the PDF, we see that the author on the left is an associate professor, and the one on the right is a student. And this faculty-student split continues down the columns, in which case capitalization may be used to distinguish between faculty and student authors. And some other issues to note are that initials included with the student's given name in the PDF do not appear in the record. And neither do affiliations. So author names in their original language are also not present in the record, but these name forms aren't in the PDF either. So adding to these earlier questions, if I'm not reading too far into the issue, does uh, capitalization suggest that seniority is more significant than affiliation in this context? And what prompted this method of recording seniority? And for the student's given name, do the initials refer to name parts or perhaps a title or other designation? And what is the significance of uh, their exclusion from the record? So these are just a few examples, but all these issues and their categorizations reflect only my perspective. So what are the caveats and limitations? And what are the implications of the findings? 
starting with what's missing, which is pretty easy, a lot. This is just one needle from the metadata haystack, and the haystack probably has millions more needles. And we knew this from the outset. This was not intended to be a comprehensive review. Rather, it was intended as a starting point to get a sense of what types of issues might be out there so that phase two could dig deeper into their prevalence. Of this needle, there are also two big buts. First, that issues and distinctions are often difficult to recognize without familiarity with um, specific regional, disciplinary, and publishing cultures. And because I have biases and knowledge gaps, there are chan the chances are high that I have misinterpreted a valid issue, spent too little time on a potential one, and read too deeply into another. Second, this review alone does not tell us which issues result from poor metadata practice and which result from deliberate interventions. Uh, taking these caveats in stride, what are the implications of these findings? Uh, well, first, while many of the identified issues may in fact be due to poor metadata practice, the potential political intentions behind their presence cannot be ignored. Measured against the possibility of harm, cultural issues in metadata engage in broader conversations and struggles around homogenizing standards and equitable participation. As such, deviations from standards or good practices should not be preemptively dismissed as input errors or problems with quality. Intentional or not, these deviations impact how cultural meanings and identities are represented, and the impacts are considerable. So next time you find an issue in the metadata, consider pausing and asking, what's at stake here, and for whom? Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Do we have, do we have time for questions? All right, we don't have time for questions. That was an excellent talk. I have, uh, I will talk to you later about stuff. Okay, uh, the next uh, talk is a Zoom talk from Kate Topham. 15 minutes and it's entitled, Days of Future Past, Examining Race Through Comics Metadata. So, I'm expecting the Zoom to sort of magically pop up on the screen. We should use these times for questions. I don't know, in my experience, I find that a lot of those missing data things are products of data being created in one place, going through some filter, which doesn't have the same data structure as the data entered, and ending up in some other place that has a different data structure, and people are lazy and they just don't figure out ways to channel the metadata. So it's not just always creator or, or uh, you know, data entry. It's often just our pipes are not good enough. Are we gonna have Zoom? Yes? What do I, do I have to do something? So we are going to use this for Zoom, okay? Well, wait, hold on. All right, all right. Yeah, but I wasn't saying anything. I'm not sure what, what's supposed to happen here. Oh, I see. Okay. Hopefully, we will see Kate soon. Oh, this is looking, looking promising. Kate, are you there? Let's hear some Yes, sound. hi. Yay! Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. All right, take it away. You have 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm Kate Topham. I'm the Digital Humanities Archivist at Michigan State University. 
Uh, my slides are on uh, the are on OSF or at this tiny URL, which I realize I put a lowercase l in it, which is confusing. So sorry about that. Um, I'm also in Slack as uh, as Toughcat. And uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm so grateful to be speaking with you all today. Uh, and um, I'm also honored to be alongside uh, some amazing presentations. I've been following along on the live stream. Um, and I wanna uh, extend my thanks to the planning committee for enabling my remote presentation today. Um, so I wanna start off with some acknowledgements. Uh, this presentation comes from a paper that I wrote with uh, Julian Chambliss, uh, professor of English at MSU, and uh, Nicole Huff, a PhD student at MSU, and Justin Weigart, a former PhD student, now graduate uh, from MSU. Uh, we have an article out in genealogy on this topic. I'm going to stick with what uh, I wrote for the article, but I do encourage everyone to go check out the rest of it um, because it's fantastic work. Um, I rely on their work and uh, it's invaluable and I'm so grateful for it. I also want to acknowledge out of hand that I am a white woman giving a presentation about race. Um, I hope I uh, come to this with some humility um, and I uh, welcome discussion and uh, suggestions for how I can better frame or uh, address or uh, talk about this topic in general. I'm always looking to learn how I can improve there. So why comics metadata? other than the fact that it's fun. <laughs> so uh, from recent years, uh, CW's Black Lightning, Into the Spider-Verse, there have been more and more comics characters of color coming to the big screen. Uh, and we also have uh, more discourse, uh, public discourse um, about the intersection of race and comics with Ta-Nehisi Coates' Black Panther and the rewriting of the comics character, the, uh, the Mandarin into Tony Lung's character in Shang-Chi. Uh, comics have long been a medium in which racial identities are represented uh, for better, but much more often for worse, uh, and places where a uh, medium in which racial oppression and anxieties are enforced and reinforced. This is due uh, in no small part to the fact that American comics emerged in the late 1800s as racism, segregation, and anti-Black violence became more blatant and severe in the post-Reconstruction era, uh, era. So uh, where is our data coming from? Uh, this, we uh, at Michigan State University, we have a huge collection of comics uh, numbering over 300,000 pieces. I'm contractually obligated to say that we're uh, one of, if not the uh, largest collections of comics that's publicly accessible in the US, if not the world. Uh, lovingly indexed by comics librarian Randy Scott, shout out to Randy who's retiring soon. Uh, the, uh, the data set, uh, that, I, that I worked with for this presentation is metadata that has been converted from MARC records of comic, comics published in the US, Canada, and Mexico between 1880 and 2018, approximately. This has been a long endeavor uh, involving a lot of my colleagues at Michigan State University, including Ronti Junis, who I saw was in the Slack. Hi, Ronti. Uh, Ronti helped us extract this data and was part of the cleaning. Um, so big acknowledgments to them. So I started with this question, what does this metadata tell us about race and racism? I am the metadata person in the graphic possibilities team that wrote the article. So this is my kind of inroad to, uh, to this work. Um, and what is, what does, so what does this metadata tell us about um, about race, about racism, how uh, discourse and thought has changed over time. Uh, there was an intent in this collection to gather a diverse array of comics. Can we see that reflected? That led me to examine the subject headings associated with each comic and think about what it means to use the subject headings as data. Uh, spoiler alert, it's pretty problematic. Uh, so I combed through our metadata to see what terms were used to describe uh, race and ethnicity in our catalog and found and categorized terms, counted them up in these categories. I fully acknowledge that these categories are problematic and difficult. 
um, especially the indigenous or American Indian column um, in our data, American Indian or Indian Americans could refer to folks who have, who uh, people who are indigenous to the United States and their descendants or people who reside in or have ancestry on the Indian subcontinent. I intentionally did not resolve this conflation because it, A, was too difficult and out of scope to do it without uh, going through each and every one of them, uh, but it also highlights the racism that's inherent in our data. Um, so as you can see, we have um, most of our terms um, Um, the indigenous or American Indian identities, um, and a, a smattering of Asian American terms, and some uh, Latin, Latin American, Latino, Latina terms. Latinx is not used in our catalog. Uh, and one singular one that references white Americans. When we plot these frequencies uh, over time, we can see that other than one exception here in 1902, these terms don't really start to be applied to comics until the, the mid-1900s, which could signal that there is more diverse identities represented in comics over time, uh, but it's not a perfect view. This increase tracks with the rise of movements against racism and towards uh, civil rights, and as well as the popularity of comics in general. Um, so you can see there's a spike of comics about uh, that have been given uh, black identity subject headings uh, in the 1990s, in uh, the 2010s and 2020s as more discourse around um, anti-Black racism were spiking. Uh, to turn briefly to uh, the, the singular uh, white Americans comic, um, the, the comic in question is titled Your Black Friend by Ben Passmore, published in 2016. It is a comic zine written in the second person, and open. it's an open letter on race and being Black in America. This comic is also assigned the subject headings Group Identity, Race Relations, African Americans, Friendship, and Racism. The only time white identity is noted in our catalog is when it is placed in opposition to another group. Um, representations of white people individually and as groups undoubtedly appear in the catalog, but the catalogers do not note this. Because of the positionality of catalogers, uh, which I'll talk about more and more, um, as, uh, as we all know, racism is embedded at every level of society and the catalog is no different, as many of uh, my fellow presenters today have mentioned. Uh, this has been extensively covered by scholars uh, like Melissa Alder, Hope Olson, Sanford Berman, among others, but I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, recognize that here. Uh, so Melissa Alder traces the history of cataloging back to Charles Cutter, who, whose works rules, of, uh, rules for a Dictionary Catalog and the unfinished expansive classification serve as models for modern classification systems, including the Library of Congress, and the Library of Congress subject headings, which we use in our catalog. Cutter took, in his words, an evolutionary approach to classification, placing subjects uh, within and outside of the natural sciences in a hierarchy as they would naturally evolve. Surprise, surprise, this uh, meant that uh, headings about marginalized people were always pushed to the end of the classification scheme. Uh, Hope Olson calls this Cutter's uh, presumption of universality, that he's uh, he's saying, oh, I'm, I can be objective. This is how a normal person would want to enter the catalog. Uh, and that normal person for Cutter is assumed white, able-bodied, male, propertied, American person. Uh, Sanford Berman, self-described librarian, a uh, radical librarian, famously published a, an in-depth heading by heading critique of problematic terms in the Library of Congress uh, subject headings, uh, including um, the extremely problematic race question, uh, but notably also highlighting uh, the racism and other uh, racism and marginalization and other terms, such as the existence of terms like these are outdated terms, no longer used, but terms like Negroes as businessmen and Negroes as farmers, with the absence of terms like Caucasian businessmen and Caucasian farmers, implying that it should be surprising or unusual somehow that Black people can do this kind of work. Um, while those terms have been uh, revised and removed, 
um, this principle of universality and hierarchy still exist in um, the Library of Congress subject headings and uh, in our catalog data. I could give examples, but don't want to belabor this point. So it's clear that some of Cutter's universality has trickled down into our catalog. We know that there are more representations of white people than this graph shows. Uh, but it reinforces the marginalization and othering of uh, people of color within our catalog. Despite uh, the, uh, this othering, the data does give us a window in rep uh, into representations of racial groups in comics over time. However, there isn't a good way to see whether that representation is respectful or if it's harmful or if it's more complex than that binary. I'm going to use a comic from 1902 as an example. I'm going to show two images of its pages in the next three slides. Um, I just want to give a brief warning that uh, these pages use racist imagery um, to give folks a little bit of warning if you don't want to see that kind of thing. It's not violent, it's just, um, it, but it may be uncomfortable. Uh, so this example is uh, Poor Lil Mose, his letters to his mammy from 1902, written by Buster Brown creator Richard Occult. It depicts a young black boy among other black characters in a style akin to that used in minstrel shows and other caricature. Poor Lil Mose writes poems framed as letters to his mammy, also a racist stereotype of black women domestic workers in a dialect, in a Negro dialect rife with slurs and epithets. The subject headings assigned to this comic are Amer African American children and comic books, strips, etc. While it is about an African American child, the heading African American children is woefully inadequate to describe how uh, what this comic, what this comic book is about. It does not give us the full picture of the racial dynamics at play. Subject headings also can't give us the full picture of racial representation in each comic. Um, next slide is the, next, the second and last page of uh, Poor Little Mose that I will show. Later on, we are presented with a letter about his visit to Chinatown, and the representation is no more respectful than that of Mose himself. This racist imagery is also not it is also not visible in our data. We do not know that this exists in this comic, so we can't see it. This speaks to a uh, fundamental problem of using our um, using subject headings as data. Subjects are generally used to communicate to users what the document, or in this case, the comic, is about. So the aboutness. In our catalog, we have both is about and instance of subject headings. So we have a lot of horror comics that are tagged as um, horror comics. Um, but that heading is also applied to books about the history of comic books in that genre. So we have both of those examples. Um, but it makes it very difficult to uh, differentiate between uh, comics about racism and comics that are instances of racism. Uh, to look at the subject heading racism, um, these subject these are not super common within our collection, um, but they seem to the headings uh, racism and the more euphemistic term race relations uh, seem to be applied um, to comics about racism rather than instances of racism in comics. Um, while po poor little Mose certainly is an example of racism in com in comics, it doesn't have the uh, it doesn't have the subject heading race uh, racism. Uh, racism appears in uh, the as a subject heading twelve times in the catalog, but uh, the term is not assigned to comments to comics before nineteen sixty five, and uh, appears most often in the twenty tens. The heading race race relations appears starting in nineteen fifty six and follows a similar pattern, uh, but is generally less used. The other subject headings in this subset bear this out a little bit. Within that subset of comics that have either the heading racism, race relations, or both of those, the phrase civil rights appears 21 times, the word history appears 20 times, and African American appears 32, 32 times. So these uh, subject headings show us that uh, these comics are about racism. They are, they are comics that discuss 
uh, civil rights, the movement against racism uh, over time in America. So the objectivity myth and the aboutness problem makes inquiry into representation of race very difficult to tease out. But these subject headings can reveal broad terms, uh, broad trends within comics. Uh, all description of race in our catalog presents non-white identities as others and presents racism as a problem for uh, minorities. Nevertheless, subject headings give us an inroad into this data that isn't otherwise available to us. And we can see um, some of the evolution of discourse on race in America, evolutions on how um, catalogers have uh, categorized and um, given applied subject headings to comics over time and uh, see the evolution of uh, depictions of race and uh, representations in the medium of comics uh, for better and for worse. So a brief, uh, what is next? What do we do next? This uh, this data wasn't super helpful in uh, in determining, you know, how race is represented in comics over time. Um, we are, uh, we're approaching our next steps as in a kind of iterative way, um, thinking about uh, this data as a prompt for more close reading um, as I, uh, I did with the 1902 Poor Little Mose comic, um, along with um, other close reading uh, analysis that's present in our article in genealogy, which is linked here on my slide. Um, Justin Weigard does a case study on indigenous representation in comics. And um, Nicole Huff has a case study on uh, BIPOC creators in horror comics, and I highly recommend you look at those. Uh, but we're hoping that this work prompts other uses of the comics as data, North America data set, and prompts more people to uh, do close readings of comics and see where, uh, what, how we can improve this. We're also, um, Experimenting with Wikidata, we've had an initiative uh, for a couple of years to add comic uh, comics data to Wikidata. Um, small plug, we are having an edit-a-thon event at the end of this month. We don't believe that Wikidata will solve this problem, uh, especially given that um, race is a very difficult topic in Wikidata. Most folks do not want to uh, have that information on Wikidata at all, which I um, tend to agree. So it's an issue um, and there's been much debate around if we do include it, how do we model it? It's such a um, difficult um, and messy thing, but uh, we do have many uh, BIPOC creators represented in our collection, and we hope our work will help uh, make uh, make those creators more visible in the linked data sphere. Um, so I, that is all I have for all of you today. I um, have no idea how much time I have left, but um, I will be in uh, in Slack, and I'm here for questions. Um, and I look forward to further development in this area of research and uh, developments in ways that we can dismantle these structures of oppression within the catalog. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kate. Although we don't really have time for question, we have a, a video to queue up for the next talk. So I'm gonna use my discretion and see if there are anyone there's anyone who has a question. There were a few in the Slack. If you want to ask them now, I'd rather listen uh, for a little bit longer than to stand around here waiting for the video to come up. I've got a question. Thank you. Um, so I guess you were talking about like people who want to not catalog race or not have race at all as a part of like metadata and Wikidata. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about like the different sides of that debate and then al maybe also in cataloging for libraries. Oh man, that's a big question. Um, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so um, there's, I'll talk about Wikidata first because I'm a little bit more familiar with that debate um, as it's been kind of recently on my mind. So uh, there's been a lot of discussion on um, how to um, how to ethically describe identity broadly in linked data and linked open data contexts. 
um, especially in the gender space because gender is so such a messy thing. And so many, there have been a lot of bots that, that automatically um, uh, add statements about an item, a person's gender based on their name, which is a terrible way to go about that. Um, there's also, it's also gender is a fluid thing. It's a spectrum. It's a lot of things. Um, and I think um, race has a similar problem in that it's subjective, it's complicated, and um, it's difficult to find references where people self-identify. And we can't, um, and if we use that, um, if we use uh, that standard, it makes it hard for historical figures, um, where, how do we categorize them? But that also uh, makes it difficult for us to see where there are where there are uh, people missing in the Wikidata sphere. So we want to recognize people's identity without further um, marginalizing them within uh, within linked open data spaces. So in cataloging, I think um, that issue of subjectivity also exists in um, like. I don't think if I were cataloging a comic, I don't think I would want to flip through and say, oh, I think this person has this racial identity, so I'm going to add that subject heading. That feels sticky to me. I don't want to decide what someone else's identity is or assume anything. Within comics, this is even more difficult because we have a lot of people who are not humans, um, but may have um, like racial coding um, and appear as different uh, ha, um, appear to have um, features that people might say like oh this person I feel represented by this person even though they're not um, they're not human they're an alien um, I was going to include an example from Eternals and then I ended up not using it because I, it was too complicated <laughs> um, to try and like figure out uh, an identity for uh, a non-human person yeah, no, so I, no, I recognize no, no. that I'm babbling <laughs> a lot right now but um, I think there's. Uh, I think it's important that we uh, that we include marginalized identities in the catalog without marginalizing them, without othering them. If we're going to acknowledge uh, BIPOC communities in subject headings, maybe we need to be more honest about um, about when um, a comic is just about white people, though that does get sticky because like. Things are written for white people most of the time because that's the way our society is. That's the way economics goes. Okay. Well, um, so it's hard to it's it's hard to make that, that decision. Anyway, it's complicated. Is my two word answer to that question? <laughs> the TLDR. Thank you very much, Kate. And yes, it's complicated. No, we have another <laughs> interesting talk to queue up. You want to go ahead? It's uh, by Jacob Shelby. Yes. Thank you, Kate. As you can hear, there's some cats in, in the Slack. Um, the <laughs> this is called Thor for the Love of Metadata. And okay. Hit it. Hello, Code for Lovers. Thanks for having me. My name is Jacob Shelby. I do data things and am employed by lyricists to help provide equitable access to the world's knowledge Recording and cultural stopped. heritage by helping our clients migrate their data from their legacy systems into lyricist hosted systems. I'm here to share my knowledge of Thor and demonstrate how Thor can help you better organize your metadata scripts and processes. What is Thor? According to whatisthor.com, Thor is a toolkit for building powerful command line interfaces. Let's begin with an overly simplified example. Imagine we have a Ruby file named MyCLI. We start by creating a class and making it a child of the Thor class. Next, we write a quick description. Then we define a method to reflect the task we want to call. This method will show up as a command within the application. That bottom piece starts up the CI. Then we can call our hello method in the terminal like so, and the application will respond. Hello, Korg. 
That is cool and all, but what does this have to do with metadata? Let's say you're processing metadata and sending it to a system via the system's API. You have an old script that has some API configuration stuff and does XYZ. You have new data and want to basically do the same thing, but need to tweak that old script. So you crib most of the data or the code and create a new script. Six months later, you have five different scripts that kind of do the same thing with little modifications. Now you have too many Hemsworths, I mean scripts, to manage. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the reasons I like using Thor to organize my metadata scripts and processes. It helps you build reusable pieces, define a re repeatable task once, use often, it organizes those reusable pieces and scripts. You have all your code in a single application rather than managing and calling a multitude of individual files. It's easier to find and call scripts or processes. Thor has a nice way of searching for tasks on the command line. And it encourages documentation. By default, it requires a short description of each task in order for each to show up in the CLI. These descriptions show up when you search for tasks on the command line, making it easy to understand and find the task you're looking for. I know not all these characteristics are unique to Thor. Reusability and don't repeat yourself, or dry, are core principles of object-oriented programming. However, Thor builds on top of these principles by making it easier to organize, find, and call the reusable pieces, and encourages documentation. Now that you've seen some of the why, let's explore some examples of Thor implementations. First up is ASpace Client Tasks. This is a collection of Thor tasks for processing data and interacting with the ASpace API. I maintain and use this application a lot when I'm doing ASpace data migrations. It provides a set of commonly used tasks, such as getting, posting, and deleting data and provides a simple way to add and customize project-specific tasks. Next is Kiba Extend. Kiba Extend is a suite of Kiba extensions useful in transforming and reshaping data. My fabulous colleague, Christina Spurgeon, maintains this one. It provides a whole host of commonly used data transformations and has saved me so much time transforming my data during data migrations. The last one is Demo ASpace Migration. This one isn't an independent application. It's an example of a typical ASpace migration that makes use of ASpace client tasks and Kiba Extend. Speaking of, this takes us to the exhilarating live-ish demo. So I'm in my demo ASpace migration repository. Everything you see on the left-hand side, except for ASpace client tasks, was generated by a template that makes use of Kiba Extend. I'm going to skip Kiba Extend for the sake of time, but if you're interested to learn more, I encourage you to look up the Kiba Extend repository. So I'm going to go into ASpace client tasks, and the first thing that I want to show you is this objects file. You'll see here we have a module called common, then we have a class called objects, which is a child of Thor. And then you'll see a bunch of methods. These methods make up the tasks that you can call within the command line. So you'll see we have a few get tasks, get resources, get archival objects, these are getting data from the ASpace API. Going further down, you'll see host resources and post archival objects. These are sending data to the ASpace API. And you'll also see delete archival objects and delete resources. These are deleting data from the ASpace API. The other file I want to show you is change.thor. You'll see up here that um, this is kind of a meta file. It strings together 
commonly use tasks to create processes. And so you'll see this first one is agents post. This one has three tasks. One, it calls a task to find the file path and file name of the data file that we want to load. Then it calls a task to load that data into memory. And then it calls a task to send that data to the API. And you'll see a few of these post tasks here. I'm going to skip down to the bottom. Let's say that we have a bunch of these tasks and I'm really lazy. I don't want to call every one of these tasks. Well, I created a very meta task called post all the things. And you'll see that this calls each of the tasks at the top of the file. So you have agents post, you have subjects post, resources post, and so on. And so when I call this one task, it will run all these other tasks for me. Now I want to show a couple of things in the command line. So first is searching. Let's say I want to search for some tasks. So to do that, I would put in Thor list, and then I would call the segment that I want to look at. So in this case, I want to look at common. And so here you'll see a whole bunch of tasks. Um, you'll see they're organized here. You'll see common. You'll see things like classifications, objects, or subjects. And then you'll see each of the individual tasks or method. Common is the module. Objects or subjects is the class. And then these are the individual methods. If I wanted to look at just subjects, I would put Thor list common subjects, and it would show me just the tasks that are organized under subjects. The one I want to look at is chains. And so you'll see this shows me all of the tasks in that chains file. And I want to actually run post all the things. So I'm going to put Thor, and then I call the full namespace for the task I want to run. And see, so you'll see that it's doing all the things I want it to. It's posting all of the data and then moving the data around as I want it to. Unfortunately, for the sake of time, I won't be able to show what this looks like in a space, but I hope this at least gives you a demonstration of what Thor looks like um, including how to call different commands in the command line. Going back to the presentation, here are all the resources I referenced in this presentation. These slides will be shared, so don't worry if you're unable to capture all of these links. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. But seriously, I appreciate the opportunity to share work that is near and dear to me, and I hope this gives you ideas for how you can manage your metadata processes. You can find me on GitHub and the Code for Lib Slack at 8Better. Thanks again. All right. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. Guess what, everyone? Uh, break time is just, just around the corner. Uh, we're running a little bit late, uh, so we will start lightning talks at, say, 2.10. Is that okay with everybody? 3.15. No. 3.10. 3.10. All right. Lightning talks. Uh, it is still not too late to sign up for a lightning talk. There are three slots left. Uh, if you are giving a lightning talk, Please come up and put anything you want to show from a computer on the computer uh, so we can race through and be done and back on schedule. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the, you can also sign up for tomorrow's lightning talks. Just go outside, grab a pen and paper, and put your title up there. And that's it. Go ahead and have a break. Bye, everyone, for a little bit. Put stuff up right here, yep. Yeah. Uh.
this is the video. We don't need the video. Uh, what's the best way to do this? Let's leave this up. Oh, this is the QuickTime player. If it's a file, just put it on the desktop. If it's a Google Doc or something, load it, create a tab, and look at it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Do we, do uh, we that, that one stays. That one stays. Uh, that one stays. Yeah. That one stays. That one stays. Okay. Yeah. So if you, you have a Google Doc. Okay. Load it up. I'll let you go first, actually. We just open a tab here. That's one way to do it. Okay, excellent. Just, just put it on the desktop. This is uh, where we move it up. Here. We'll unplug this. We can plug that in. Yeah, can use that one. You have to move the cursor back to the screen. There you go. There you go. Right there. And right here. Just put it on the desktop, yeah. Okay. Done. Good. All right. Sure. Sure. Just. Thank you. Slide. Right. So. Yeah. Thank you. So. This is in my. Oh, well, I can just not do this. I, I can just not do this. That's fine. I just won't do that. And we'll just go to the website instead. Yeah, if you have it on the website, just do that. to make sure I use one that has NVS in it though. To make sure I get the one I want. Okay, that's the one I want. Excellent. Alright. Alright. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. Let's see. 
Uh, my friend helped me uh, figure it out. All right, cool. Back to you. Yeah, she put it on the. What do you want to do? Uh, she put it on the on the desktop here. You want to put it on the desktop? No, she put it on the desktop at lunchtime, but because those are showing up, it's hard to see them. Thank you. Yeah, they're right. Well, you're the one who has to find it. You have to find it when you come up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so the you know first where it is. One. I'm the first one. Oh, you're the first one. Yeah. All right. Um, what do you want me to come up uh, just just before? Come up in five minutes. Okay. Thank you, sir.
Hello? Let's start uh, getting back into the room for the lightning talks. All right, now that we are officially after 3 o'clock, we have a new set of community support volunteers. That's Ann Slaughter. Yay. Anne-Marie Mesco. Yay. OK, you're all here. All right, I'd like to address the elephant in the room while we get into our seats. You know how society has become more and more divisive, and that, that also applies to our community. Some people in our community call it code for lib, and other people call it code for lib. So I'd like to hear, I'd like to see uh, a show of hands. How many of you use the correct pronunciation? <laughs> How many of you use the wrong pronunciation? Yeah. OK, that sets us up for really nicely for our first lightning talk, which is from Craig Rosenbeck. Did the, the oh. cursor go over there? Over here. No? There you go. Yes. All right, time starts. Oh, no, you have to move it to the, to the screen. Sorry about that. Sorry. Time hasn't started yet. <laughs> oh, come on. Just, just grab the, yeah, can I do it? Yeah, please. Thank you. Let's see. Problem. Where is it? Uh, can it show? All right. Thank you. Start timer. Oh, and the real microphone works now. Oh, great. Yes. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, yes. Yes. I I'm working on your project. Yeah. I I'm getting it. Wait a second. You're going to the cloud. We never talked about the cloud talked about this device that we we're going to run self-hosted. Well, why did you mention about the Christmas tree if you don't want it self-hosted anymore? You don't want the Christmas tree? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> I thought we had all this in specs and I had this all ready to go when you want to go to the cloud. All right, well, uh, yeah, I'm listening. Do you still want a Christmas tree? And I have a board. No, you don't want that either. All right, well, thank you. We'll talk to you next week about you going somewhere else. All right, bye. So we have some things uh, that we think that we're listening to our users and we may be talking about things that they thought uh, we were telling and we thought that they were telling us. So we're going to talk uh, briefly about using our ears in information architecture development and systems administration. Do you have moments closing your ears on users? Listening habits are important to information architecture and systems administration. Most of us are problem solvers or troubleshooters. So we want to solve the problem that is before us. Instead, we need to pause to listen.
How are your ears? Let us open our ears to what people are requesting. Repeat what they're requesting. I find this helpful to converse with a user. What am I hearing you say is, listen without interrupting. Let's train our ears. I have the earbuds in and wonder, you're talking about Christmas trees and uh, other small arm technology and in reality, they're wanting you to do a metadata project. Tell me what, if this is correct, what you're saying. Do I really hear what you're saying? So let us go with open ears to serve our users. Try opening your ears at break or during a meal. Pair up with one another. One person comes up with a problem, and the second one opens their ears using listening skills with their mouth closed. You have a minute to see how it goes. Thank you. All right, that was, that was great. Uh, Maccabee Levine. See. Come on. There we go. All right. Code for Lib, hello. I'm going to talk about acquisitions better, uh, a thing we built called the Purchase Request Platform. Print and ebook acquisitions. Okay, this is easy. Does your library buy books, print or ebooks? Show of hands, please. I hope I hate some out. Okay, right. Hands down. Have you, Code for Libbers, worked on any projects to help collection development or acquisitions recently? Define that however you want. Okay, a few hands, right? But I think there's room for, for us all to be involved and to help. At Lehigh, we cared about getting more patron input, right? Demand-driven acquisition in, in some smarter ways. Having a more efficient process for our selectors and our acquisition staff to deal with collection development. Uh, putting some of our acquisitions dollars towards more diverse vendors and improving communication among our staff. So we built the thing, uh, open source, purchase request platform to get more patron input from multiple sources assist selectors in evaluating the requests with supporting information, and assist us in, in acting on them. Some URLs at the bottom there. Basic architecture, number of different client applications, which I'll show off in a minute, and requests from all these different applications flow into a central, a central server, uh, which puts stuff into a Kanban board. We use Jira, the free version, um, but other uh, sites support it as well, and then enriching it with various other bits of data via APIs to support the decision making by the selectors and then acting on it by the acquisition staff. So examples of, of input sources. Our return slips have this little sticker on the bottom of them. Would you suggest this title be added to Lehigh Library? Circle yes or no. No one circles no, but quite a few people circle yes, so then what do we do with it, right? Um, so simple little one-page web app, scan the barcode on the top of that return slip. That's an indication of patron interest. Uh, simple task for our lending services staff to do. Little pop-up confirming that it's that kind of book. Hit enter, and it sends that into our workflow, integrating with a bunch of different sources for where those um, return slips might have come from. Similarly for librarian requests. They find out about a book they're interested in on whatever website using a... A uh, free plugin we found there to search uh, Amazon for that item, not to buy it from Amazon, just as a pass-through, and then a little tamper monkey script here to then allow the librarian to click a button that we add to the page and submit that as a purchase request, um, either pre-approved or for later consideration. Um, of course, we have a website form. Hopefully, everybody has a website form for, for patron input. Um, so nothing too surprising. So give us a title and an author. Let's see if we already have it in our collection. If we don't have it in our collection, here's the form. And one of the questions we ask is, what level of urgency is the request? If they say, it's a nice to have, not immediate, let's, let's not deal with that in, in Amazon or, or our fastest possible booksellers. Let's, um, we, support, we use Bookshop to support um, BIPOC and local booksellers that more meet with our university's values. Just by asking the question, we can do that. There are implicit sources of purchase requests as well. Duplicate requests from interlibrary loan, um, lost items that we might or might not want to replace. All of these go into a single Kanban board. I mentioned we use the free Jira. I would love someone to be interested in using Trello for this. The idea is to centralize them all 
and then enrich them, for example, with vendor pricing, because the selectors always want to know how much it's going to cost. So let's get that from Oasis. We're working on eBook Central, these other sources as well. Let's see, do we already have a copy of it? Do our consortia have a copy of it? Put all that information in the JIRA comments right there so the selector can easily make that decision without clicking into Google Scholar and everywhere else. Here's just an example of a JIRA comment showing pricing results coming from Oasis and one of our librarians saying, yep, let's buy that. I'll get the paperback. Thank you. A lot of communication this has helped between our selectors and our acquisition staff. They're fans of it. The folks at ERNL um, uh, uh, give it a, a finalist uh, award thing a couple weeks ago. It seems to be that acquisitions folks are a fan of it. We're interested in, in improving it by input from other libraries. We'd love some other folks to be interested in it. If you're interested, let me know. Find me on the Slack here. Uh, that that webpage, go.lehi.edu slash purchase request, it's non-techie friendly, hopefully. There's some links to our GitHub there. Um, but uh, if, if it sounds like something your acquisitions or your collection folks would be interested in, please share that. And thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Sorry for the technical back and forth there. Uh, hi, my name is Hardy Pottinger. I am a publishing systems developer at California Digital Library. And this talk is all about the unofficial bash strict mode. Uh, I think you're probably thinking, OMG, bash? Uh, show of hands, who has written or uh, fixed a bash script? Yeah, <laughs> it's everywhere, right? Uh, almost every Docker image runs some kind of bash script, and pretty much every open source project has some kind of bash script in it. It's glue, right? Uh, but it's kind of brittle by default. Uh, speaking of defaults, it's uh, been the default shell for uh, Linux for the last 30 years. Uh, what is strict mode? Uh, it is, you've heard of it, it's prob you've probably used it. It is the magic words at the beginning of a script. Uh, lots of languages have this feature. It's a way to opt in to a restricted variant of the language. Uh, why would you want this? It helps you catch mistakes. If I'm sure you've seen Perl or JavaScript that starts with use strict. Python, alas, it's already strict enough. Uh, not everyone agrees, but that's the rep. Uh, unofficial bash strict mode. These are the magic words. You can jot them down. You can read the blog post at that link. Um, the set line uh, causes the script to fail under additional circumstances. Dash E causes bash to fail. If any subcommand fails, bash scripts do not stop on, on error by default, but they should. Uh, dash U causes the script to fail if you use an un unbound variable. If you make typos as many times as I do, you want that. Uh, dash O, uh, pipe fail, uh, prevents errors inside a pipeline from being masked. Any command in a pipeline that fails should cause the parent script to fail. Uh, bash scripts have pipes in them. Uh, sometimes, so if something fails inside that pipe, you want to know. Uh, the IFS setting tends to be uh, produce more useful behavior in your script. By default, Bash only uses a space character as a delimiter when it's parsing strings into the list. The IFS line here adds new line and tab characters to the list of possible delimiters. It's a nice addition, but you uh, may not need it. Uh, you can read the blog post for more on all of these details. So here's the thing, scripts fail, you know? Subcommands fail, typos happen, uh, stuff happens. And if part of your script fails, you wanna know before the problem gets any bigger. I have a story for you. Uh, Janeway, the journal publishing platform uh, that we use at CBL had, has an upgrade script and it's written in bash. It didn't have strict mode enabled and one of the migrations uh, that we ran during an upgrade failed and we didn't catch it. Uh, ro technically rolling back a J Django migration is theoretically possible, uh, but it's not guaranteed to work. But we got lucky, and with the help of the team at Birkbeck, we got it all sorted out. But I immediately made a PR to turn on strict mode for that upgrade script, and it has since caught other mistakes, uh, because uh, we don't need that kind of fun every day. Uh, neither do you. Please, use the unofficial strict mode for bash scripts that uh, you use. I think. Uh, we might have time for questions, maybe. No, all right. Uh, then run along. Hey, you know, if you have other, uh, there, I know there are other bash uh, uh, options. 
if you've got some favorites and you want to share them with me, just let me know. Thank you. Next up is Max Cato. Hi all, I'm Max Cadel. I'm a developer here at Princeton University Libraries. Um, and I'm gonna talk about feature flags and disability. So what is a feature flag? Uh, they're also known as feature flippers and toggles. They're a software pattern that allows teams to change the behavior of a system without needing to deploy. Um, and they come out of the continuous integration and continuous deployment movement uh, and some of the main values of that movement include that main or trunk should always be deployable, uh, which allows for fast, a fast feedback loop and quicker iterations. Um, it started out as an alternative to long running feature branches. Um, and one reason is because merge conflicts on long, long running branches are a stonking nightmare. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have like taken longer to merge a branch that's been out uh, of main for a long time than it took to write the code that made the change. That's always fun. Uh, and the idea, uh, Martin Fowler, um, I, he either originated it or popularized it. So what does this have to do with disability? So I have many flavors of neurodivergence. The folks who know me will not be surprised to hear that I have anxiety, among other things. Um, and there are some accommodations that I mostly implement myself um, that help me manage these. And those include preparation, time, uh, low stakes venues to make mistakes, and predictability. Um, so recently we had an external service that we were, we were needing to swap to. Uh, and maybe it was gonna happen next week and we need to be ready but maybe it was gonna happen next month, or maybe in six months. But we definitely needed to be ready, but we couldn't do it yet because it wasn't ready yet. Um, <laughs> so, as a person with anxiety, <laughs> that made me anxious. Um, so, um, so I suggested we use a feature flipper so that we could go ahead, write the code, get it ready, get it into main, have it tested on our staging and QA environments. Um, that would mean we wouldn't have future merge conflicts or rebases. As the other service got closer and closer to production, we could iteratively test it on those staging and QA environments. Um, and it could also be tested by stakeholders. Uh, so this is just a screenshot of the very simple dashboard that we used. Uh, we used the flip-flop gem in this case. There are a number of, of other Ruby gems and other implementations. Um, how am I on time? Two minutes. Two minutes, whoa. One hour. One hour. Okay. <laughs> uh, so there was another instance where we could have used a feature flipper we didn't, and then main was undeployable for a certain period of time. Uh, it was kind of stressful. Things weren't quite working. We couldn't make other updates because the first updates weren't in main. Um, I'm not sure how much more. Uh, in my slides, I have links to some code if you really want some code. Um, there are a couple drawbacks to using feature flippers. Um, it means that you have more cleanup. Um, they can become te tech debt if you ignore them. Um, even if it's in main, if you're not actually using code, it can get buggy. Um, and this is sort of Ruby on Rails specific, but if it's the code is in initializers, it uh, might have weird behavior if you try and put it in a feature flipper. Um, so yeah, so that is how I use this software pattern as a, an accommodation for my own particular set of disabilities. Thanks, y'all. Cool. All right, thank you, Max. Next up is Justin Coyne. 
Ooh, right. fought. I need to go full screen. No. There we go. Uh, hello, my name is Justin Coyne, and I'm a software developer for Stanford University. I'm going to talk a little bit about import map today. I was wondering if I could get a show of hands for everyone who writes JavaScript that is deployed on a web browser. That's pretty good. I'd say it's like maybe a third, a quarter to a third of us. Uh, there's a new feature in, in web browsers. In fact, web browsers have gotten so much better over the last like five years. They keep adding all these new features. And it makes um, your life as a developer so much easier. Um, I used to hate kind of doing JavaScript for the web browser. Um, but this new feature makes it a little bit less painful. Uh, so if you go and look at the docs, like what's an import map? It's a JSON object that allows developers to control how the browser resolves module specifiers when importing JavaScript modules. That's a mouthful. Um, that probably doesn't mean a lot to anybody. <laughs> so uh, just to break that down, what you can do is have a, add a script tag up in your head. And inside the script tag, you give it a type of import map. And you give it a little blob of JSON that says, hey, this symbol here, when I say bootstrap, it resolves to this URL over here. Um, and then when you write your script, you can say, hey, import bootstrap from bootstrap, and it's resolving to that mod or that, that keyword you defined earlier. Um, you could have called it anything, um, but bootstrap helps us keep track of what it is. And why, why would I do that? Um, in, in the past, what we've had to do is uh, do a whole compile step locally. So you'd have to install like Node on your machine. You need to um, install NPM, and you need to download all your dependencies, and then you compile them, and you transpile them, and you might have different languages that are going in there. Well, this skips all those steps. So it makes everything like a lot easier. It is like, you're just editing HTML. It's kind of like the old days, but we're still using modules, so we have encapsulation, um, and it kind of keeps responsibilities separate and keeps your dependencies straight. Um, another thing that's great to have about this is that easier debugging. If you find that you have a bug in your script that's all minified and transpiled, it is like there's a bug on line one, character 5,437 of application.js. Um, that's, that's challenging. This will say like, oh, it's, it's in that library that is parsing a regular expression. Um, in, in the modern world with like HTTP2, um, smaller files offer better caching dynamics. Uh, it used to be that, hey, if I, could, if I could ship you all my JavaScript and you'd cache it, and anytime you come back to my site, you can load it from your cache. But if you had to make a small change, like there's a typo, you recompile your JavaScript, and now you invalidated the cache that two megs of JavaScript you shipped to your clients are no longer cached. They have to get you know, the whole thing over again. Now it's just that one file that changed that had the typo in it. So it might be you know, a couple K, everything else they're getting from their cache. Um, so dog fooding this. Um, this little application that I'm running the slideshow, it's called reveal.js. I'm loading it by using import map. So I just wanted to show you that, hey, it's possible. Live code. Um, one of the caveats here is it's not supported on Safari 16.3, which is the most recent release. Um, but, oh, I don't get the up-to-date slides here, but uh, there's a polyfill down here. So you can add this, and then Safari will be happy to do it. It like pretends it has the feature now. Um, if you want any more links, um, there's this jspm.io. It has a generator, and it will help you write the boilerplate code you want, including all the imports you want to add. And if you go to this uh, other one, this can I use import maps, it shows you let all the browsers support it. And that's it. Thank you. I learned so much from these lightning talks. Thank you. Next is Devin Murphy. Newcomers, yeah. Yay, thank you. Yay. No, it's OK, so hello. I'm Devin Murphy. I am the metadata analyst at University of Texas at Austin. And I was inspired by many of the sessions today to talk about one of my own examples 
with critical metadata, a term that we heard earlier in Jackson's presentation. So I say critical metadata intentionally instead of other terms like critical cataloging or reparative description. Uh, one, because it's not reparative in a lot of cases. You have materials and collections that might need to be repatriated and they're not, or digital repatriation of materials. Or maybe the descriptions or changes you're making to metadata might not be truly representative or have any consultation from that community, the latter of which of something I experienced last year. So this screenshot is from LADI, or Latin American Digital Initiatives, a project out of Lilas Benson, yes, lots of acronyms, Lilas Benson Latin American Studies and Collections at UT, um, headed by the wonderful Teresa Polk, um, one of my colleagues there. And we have a variety of post-custodial uh, post relationships with different partners, uh, uh, archival partners in Latin America. This one uh, with the um, Archivo Judicial uh, de la Sala do Puebla in Mexico. And these materials are part of a collection of like indigenous land titles, claims, and court records from the 1500s to the 1800s. And they are very important for the indigenous communities in Cholula in that they establish like a history of land ownership and claims to those materials, as well as you know biographical information. Um, as part of that relationship, we help with you know, putting materials on this site, maintaining um, digital, these digital files, and in return, we also uh, share um, metadata expertise when needed, digitization materials, that kind of thing. Um, and as part of my job last year, was looking at the metadata, making sure we had things spelled right, what have you, and I noticed, like in this description here, um, a lot of the word used to the word term indios or indio, Indian, right? Um, and I was thinking, well, in other art descriptions, we have been changing this term uh, to indigenous peoples or the Spanish equivalent of pueblos indígenas. Do we need to do that here? And I'm glad I stopped and didn't move forward and talk to Teresa and other colleagues. Um, and we decided, well, let's ask the people who worked with, both the people at the archive, people in the source communities, and our own experts who had worked on the project with us, indigenous experts at UT Austin. And after a lot of deliberation, we found that Indios was the better term. So it was easier for those source communities to find materials in our collection using that term. It's the term they apply to themselves, even if it isn't a term adopted by you know, us at UT Austin or in other scholarly communications across you know, uh, Latin America and here, um, where Pueblos Indígenas or Indigenous peoples are more often used. So um, it's important for for, uh, for us at our institution, and I guess elsewhere too, to have more um, of a relational approach to metadata, right? So your content, and I'm using here the model from the Centering Relationality article from Little Tree, Bellarde Lewis, and Duarte have a lot of, you know, owe a lot to them, um, where the institution is at the like large part of the circle. We are interrelated with the people and the ideas and their, their um, cultural heritage. We're at like the center of the relational circle there. Um, and so we have to maintain those relationships between each other, not just with you know, having this post custodial relationship, but also continuing those relationships as we massage metadata, as we aggregate to other systems in the future. And so we, we do this one-off, um, not one-off, we do this ad hoc with lots of different partners, but we are now starting to actually meet as a group across our institution to do this in a more focused way, have more actual policies that we can fall back on um, in order to um, make our collections more responsive. So, you know, yes, we have content warnings. Yes, we take off images that are um, harmful, a lot of, you know, fun genocide archives, so a lot of unfortunate images in our content. Um, but instead of just doing that work, um, creating workflows and ways to put community input into that process before we do it. So a big difference for us. But yeah, thanks for having me. Enjoy this, you know, record. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Devin. Next is Carrie Gordon. Hopefully. Uh, and you take a look up here. We still have three empty slots okay. and we are back on there schedule time, right? so oh, you can sign up and people won't get mad at you for extending the day too much oh great there's no key oh, out on this oh man okay well let's uh keynote yeah it, it, sort of, <laughs> it comes with it comes with uh it must be on there 
can't believe it. Here it is. Yeah. It's an amp. I don't think it's actually a... Oh, welcome to the App Store. Okay, well, my presentation, uh, which was not a response to, but, uh, but inspired by the, uh, the first presentation today, was about how to, how to avoid dying when your, your clients have the uh, ability to destroy their sites and need them restored. So I'm just going to try to do this off the top of my head. Uh, so we are, I'm with the Cherry Hill Company. We are library technology hired guns serving mostly public libraries, but not entirely. We have about 100 sites of various sorts online, uh, from the simplest website to very complex uh, apps like digital asset management systems. We are AWS based, and uh, I am the, uh, uh, we're a small company, like five people total, and not all of them part full time, and I'm, I'm the gearhead, so, and I'm the system administrator and system designer. So, what we do, hopefully I can remember this, is what we do is we, we try to keep things simple, uh, there are like 200-some Amazon services. There were only two when we started. Uh, so we use EC2, which is uh, the virtual servers, and we use uh, EBS, which is elastic block stores, which is disks. Uh, we use S3, and we use some supporting services as well, but those, those are the key, and those are also the key to how we how we recover when our clients kill us. So uh, with EBS, and I could have a picture of this, when you look at the EBS screen, <laughs> this is, seems crazy <laughs> describing this, uh, but I can't log into it here. So uh, when, when you look at the screen for your instance, uh, under, um, I believe under, uh, uh, drives, whatever they call drives, uh, there's a, uh, you scroll down, there's a little thing called replace root volume. So we do a lot of snapshots. Snapshots are cheap. And we've discovered that replace, we've discovered by people killing us that replace root volume will, you know, you can just do that, and it'll take like five minutes. They have a thing called Fast Snapshot Restore, which is a wonderful thing, costs a fortune. We don't use it because our, our clients are cheap, and we're cheap. So uh, we don't use that. So for your root volumes, you can replace them quickly. For other volumes, you just restore them through the normal restore process. So we have had clients just about destroy their sites. Uh, unfortunately, we can't tell them you can't have full admin and privileges because they think that's what they're paying for, and if they're your clients, that is what they're paying for. So, but we, when it, when things go bad, it's on us to fix them. So we use that. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention, and I can share this with you later in some better way, but the other thing I want to mention is uh, S3. S3 when it started was just S3, you have S3, that's it. There was no, there was no versioning, no nothing, no Glacier, none of that. Now there's about, I don't know, seven or eight versions. Uh, most of, mostly for object storage, we use standard S3, and we do use versioning, so we can quickly roll back things you know, when, when we can afford it, when it's appropriate, we use versioning so we can quickly roll things back. And our S3 bills are not very high. They're pretty low. But, you know, occasionally you want to put things, or often you want to store things in deep storage, you can put them in Glacier. But uh, Glacier now, it, for real Glacier, it's like it could take weeks to get stuff back. Uh, they have a thing, it's, I think it's called Fast Restore, it's the actual names in my slide, uh, and that 
usually takes hours, but it could take longer. And then they have, I think it's called Instant Restore, which is not much more expensive. It's still Glacier, and you get it back almost instantly. And the way this works and why it's affordable is because if you do this every day, they'll cut you off. You know, you can't do that. But hopefully you're not destroying your site every day. If you are and you're our client, uh, we'll suggest you go somewhere else. But, uh, but so, you know, that's, that's really what we do. And we've managed to make it through a lot of years and a lot of, oh my God, our site is gone, everything's gone, all our assets are gone without dying. So I'll try to put this up somewhere. If you have any questions about AWS at any time, we do do consulting, but most of you probably don't need that. Uh, happy to talk to you about it. Happy to talk to you about it for free. It doesn't matter. Thank you. And that's how a pro does a lightning talk. Uh, just a quick note. We're going to have some time after. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of time after, after Maggie's talk to have questions for any of the the, uh, have question, if you have questions for any of the speakers, uh, we have a little bit of time to, to, to use. So this is uh, Maggie Chow. I have your YouTube second. Did you find your thing? I found my screen, but I didn't turn my booth. This is one, right? All right. Okay, so this is one. The Mac won't always take one to Ruby. There you go. Yeah. Oh, I'm Maggie Zhao. I'm developer at Yale University Library. Uh, you, I just signed up for Lightning, so <laughs> I use my old PowerPoint. Like, that is much first. Okay, uh, MyData Cloud is our internal used uh, application. It's built on the Java and uh, Spring. Um, it's kind of like a side project for our long-term um, uh, new. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, MyData Cloud is a uh, kind of like a side project for our long-term um, project. It's like um, uh, we have, uh, we are building, we have been built a new digital collection uh, system. We started the project in 2020 um, to replace our old digital collection system, which is, uh, which is called uh, Find It. We also uh, retired our in-house uh, digital collection management system called Ladybird. Um, during that time, we think, uh, re rethink about our uh, architecture of the um, digital collection, I mean, digital system, because um, our digital collection, including uh, most, in, uh, most of the cl collection come from Ladybird, the in-house uh, digital collection management system, also have data from ILS, which is uh, Voyager data and the archive space is space. Um, we, we want to build something we can use not only for digital collection system, but also can be used for other projects. So we, we start building this uh, metadata cloud. It's kind of serve as data cloud. So we can retrieve data from this application into the digital collection system. So for the A space, the data is JSON um, format for uh, Voyager data is mac, uh, mac record on, and Ladybird is, we get the data directly from database. So we map all the, all the data into like a unified um, um, output uh, in, can be in JSON or in XML. So there are a lot of data mapping, um, a lot of metadata um, library or export 
involved in these projects. So valine output uh, can be, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it's kind of the two part. One part is API. Uh, you can specify the source like IRS, and for this, you can specify the BIP, uh, and then you can get the JSON. Or you can combine with holding um, or map hand, uh, holding, I mean, map hand ID with BIP ID, or barcode ID with uh, BIP ID, or item ID with BIP ID. You are going to get all the uh, information, I mean, all the uh, record based on the request. Mm, for Ladybird, it's kind because of it's our in-house, so we have like a unique um, ID we call the uh, OI ID. Uh, for A space, we use A space um, and then A space URI. Kind of, if you use that, you could make a, a repository number and then uh, archive space, uh, not archive space number. We also have like a kind of specified a space. Oh, yeah. Uh, we if you didn't specify the source like IS or a space, just you can just request the barcode. If you request barcode, um, you may get both um, record in the Voyager, also record in a space. Depends on if the record existing in two systems. Okay, yeah. So, and also, um, we built the activity stream. Activity stream like update, delete, and um, create it. So, uh, we use this for digital collection system. Also, we have Gobi, which is a German company. We get the data from Metadata, Metadata Cloud. Uh, Recently, we just integrated the archive space with our one search. We also use metadata cloud as a source and the activity stream to ingest data. And from last, last week, we are going to integrate the DCS, I mean, digital collection system into our one search. Also, we are going to use our metadata cloud. So it's like a data cloud we can use for multiple projects. Thank you. That's my presentation. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. And thank you to all of the speakers who kept to time. So we're in good shape on our, our clock. Uh, I was just wondering, are there any pressing questions that people want to ask of any of the speakers, the lightning speakers? Or should we just go on? Can we let Carrie say one more thing? Okay. <laughs> Carrie, you get to say one more thing. The last slide in my presentation. No, oh, no, no, you got to have the mic. <laughs> the last slide in my presentation had five lines on it. And those five lines were all the same. Pay for business support if you use AWS. Because if you don't, you can solve your problem. If you find a problem you can't solve yourself, you could solve it in a week or two without that. But if you need it solved now, business support is totally you must have. And it's not that expensive either. OK. Uh, next up, we have an in-person talk from Lucas Mack. Yes? Is he not here? Lucas. Come right up. His topic is automating fast subject headings, heading maintenance in digital repositories. All right, your 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 talk is is. I said code. Uh, What's it called? Yeah, Polly. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Super. Do you want a mic or do you want to use that? I will use this one. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll set my, my time. Okay. Uh, let's see.
Um, my name is Lucas Mack. I'm with Michigan State University Library. Uh, I am a cataloger by training. Uh, I'm mostly now responsible for digital collections matter. Uh, but for my cataloging job, I still do some of it uh, and also do some NACO name authority record review for the library and also for, for them to do some uh, batch processing. Um, today I'm going to talk about like how we maintain the fast subject headings in our digital repository. Uh, some background, um, the digital repository we have is an Indora based one, uh, Fedora backend and uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, Fedora backend. We have the um, many of the standards we use, Mods and Dublin Core. Um, and we have some collection that have Mark XML as well as uh, the ETDMS. That's only for the um, electronic theses and dissertation. And our digital repository have uh, OAIP image ability. So um, we can harvest uh, our metadata records through OAIP image. And we expose Mods and Dublin Core. And it's part of our agreement with the DPLA Michigan Hub. Um, and we also set up sets in the OAI uh, instance. So based on the individual collections we have, so we can like specify which collection to have as the metadata. And that's really helpful when we want to target the maintenance of subject metadata within certain collections. So we can specify like which one or multiple collections we want to update. Um, for the subject matter, originally at the start of the digital collections, uh, digital repository, uh, we use LCX only. Um, we start using FAST, uh, which is FASTED application of subject terminology, back in 2016, and is an OCLC project, and is pretty much they derive the FAST subject headings from the LCX and LC names headings. Um, we use that for metadata creation. We store the URIs of the fast headings in the mods records. We store that in the value UI attribute uh, in the subject element. And we do like manual assignment sometimes. Uh, we use like um, spreadsheet for original metadata creation. And sometimes we do create the mods record directly. And we like just insert the text string for the subject headings and also uh, record the URIs. Uh, but a lot of time we convert them Recording from in progress. OCLC, uh, using the OCLC Fast Link Data API or the Fast Converter. That's a tool provided by OCLC uh, if we have a like mark record. And sometimes we even directly download the Fast Heading from Wellcat. Uh, we use fast heading for display and discovery. We display the fast heading in the item level metadata page. And also we use that for fasting. And also we have a subject language card on our uh, repository. And that also uses the fast uh, subject headings as well as like the um, authority data for like displaying the borrow term, narrow term, and related terms. Um, just like LCSH fast headings also change over time uh, because like the source of fast is mostly from LCSH or LC names. Um, so once that got changed on the LC side, they got carried over to fast. And some of, some of the changes are native to fast. Like somehow LC, uh, OCLC changed like Holocaust, comma, Jewish, a lot of inverted headings to direct entry, like in this case, to Jewish Holocaust. Um, there are like different causes for subject having change, like natural causes, like people died, like QE2. So we closed the date from 1926 to 1926-2022. And also like the end of the war, then we closed the date. And sometimes it's like the evolving usage of the subject terminology, so Cochrane, that, that was a, a, a quite a few years ago, and like our authority librarian was not very happy about that because there are lots of uh, headings in the catalog that need to be changed, like from Cochrane to Cocking. And also recent years, there are DEI concerns, like the infamous illegal aliens case. So it got split into non-citizens and illegal immigration, and also some other offensive, relatively offensive terms, 
like mental uh, retardation, they change it to intellectual disability. Um, the consequences if we don't keep up to date, um, we will have coexistence of old and new headings in the repository. So that affect recall uh, and collocation and also in the facet, it will show like two different subject headings but meaning the same thing. And there are different types of changes. Um, some of them are si very simple, like just change the headings, the string, but didn't change the URI. Like this one, Haiti Earthquake, they, they added the location in the qualifier. So in, in terms of the changes, that just a simple string replacement in, in the MOPS record. But there are some other uh, more complicated changes, like deprecation. They can cancel an authority record so both the headings as well as URIs got changed. Like some got uh, changed from one heading to two headings, like the illegal aliens case. But some of them is like changed from one to two, but you need to pick one of them to use, not both of them. So like the concentration camps case, is split into Nazi, Nazi concentration camps or internment camps. So you need to pick the correct one. They are different things. So which new headings to use, it depends on the context. We want to maintain the subject headings using existing infrastructure we have because like, uh, we try to not bother our programmers as because, and also because they are actually, they don't have free time in the last year because we just migrated our system to Folio and they're busy building the viewfind discovery layer for the Folio. Um, so we try to use existing infrastructure like OIPMH, XSLT, and the OCLC Fast API to do the heading maintenance. So the simple, like the steps are pretty simple. Like we use the uh, XSLT to extract the mouse record per OAI set through the OIPMH, and we query the Fast API by URIs stored in the mouse record. We compare the headings in the mouse against the heading string we get from the Fast database. If it's different, then replace the subject headings and sometimes URI, URIs uh, in the mods, convert the mods into DC, and we ingest both of them back into the repository. The problem is uh, it's not really, really simple. There's like some consideration about the processing efficiency. Um, some fast headings are used multiple times in, in the digital repository. Like Michigan, we use that uh, 139,000 times. So if we process the record by record, then we are making lots of API calls of the same URIs to the, uh, to the OCLC API, and also doing the same comparison repeatedly. Um, so we want to minimize the repeated comparisons. Uh, so after we uh, have all the MOTS record, we create a unique set of URI fast heading in mods set, uh, and the record, record IDs that all the mods that use that set. Uh, the exception is like, if we already have the new and old headings in the, in the digital repository, then we will have two new set for that uh, URI. And then we will do one API call per unit set per the URI. So we can do the comparison once. And if change is detected, we write the change to uh, the change set to a new file, and then only the mods with the change heading will be processed based on the record IDs that in in that uh, unit set. And also, we want to make sure the changes are correct. Uh, they're like the simple ones; they are typically low risk, like the one-to-one -one change, and also the one-to-many that we can use both, like the uh, illegal aliens case we can use both the non-citizens and illegal immigration. But for the either or case, like the concentration camp case, we need some manual review. So we will export a table showing the before and after headings. So we can eyeball it and, and see uh, if that is correct. And or which one we, can, we, can, uh, we should use. So the final, finalized steps, uh, sorry for the ugly uh, graphic. Uh, we start with the XSL, and we do the OIPMH to call uh, the records out from the repository. We have the mods, and then we build that 
unique set of URIs, headings, and record IDs. And then we do the API calls and do a comparison. And then we got a change set. So we can use that set to run that against the mods to just process the mods records that are affected. And then we have a set of updated mods records. We flip them into Dublin Core, and then we re-ingest them back to the repository. So at the end, uh, we updated 3,088 mods records. And the unintended uh, benefits of that is it catches a lot of typos and errors in the subject matter, like misspelling in subject string. Because some of them we do it, we did it in uh, manually. So like typo in when you type or we copy and paste wrong, we didn't know. Uh, sometimes we got the wrong URI because <laughs> sometimes we clone the 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 um, the um, subject elements because it has um, a lot of attributes. We just clone it and replace the values that we need to replace, but. We replaced the heading string, but forgot to replace the URI. So the URIs are actually pointing to a different string and got caught by the script. And also, sometimes we copy the wrong URIs. Like in this case, like when I was eyeballing the, the changes, somehow I saw that this one, like Ali got changed to Alice Jim 1893 and what's going on is totally different person. At the end, it, I discover is because when we copy the URI, we miss the last digit of the URI. <laughs> so it's a totally different entity. So the future plan, um, we want to have regular maintenance of the subject metadata in the repository. So uh, we have three releases per year, so we plan to run it once per release. And also we have separate routines for LSSH and the uh, name authority file headings, mostly used for authors. Uh, we have them separate right now. We want to merge them together and run them all together uh, so we can minimize the number of reingest job. And also, like when we run one of them and without running the other at the same time, sometimes like QE2, she died um, last year. LC updated the um, authority record first, and that got cut and 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 replaced in our meta. But fast hasn't, and that is like it's still with an open date. So in the same record, you have one with the dev date, one with the open date. So that's totally wrong. I think that's it. Okay, we have like a minute for questions. If anyone has a question for Justin, sorry, <laughs> Lucas. Yeah, it's a long day. <laughs> it's a long day. No questions. It's a long day. Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. All right, next uh, we have a uh, Zoom presentation from Mike Giarlo and uh, Justin Littman. And it's called something that's going to be very useful for us How to Rebuild a Jumbo Jet at 30,000 Feet Strategies for Digital Library Migration. And look on the screen, there's Mike Giarlo himself. Okay, give us a sound check. Phone check one, two. All right, you're good. Go for it. Okay, man. sweet. Thank you. Let me go ahead and get my screen shared here. All right, great. Uh, I think we're ready to get started. Um, great. So I'm Mike Giarlo. This is Justin Littman, and we are software developers at Stanford University and Jersey Boys as well. Um, through 20, from 2017 through last year, our team at Stanford Libraries migrated the Stanford Digital Repository, or SDR, to a new data store and a new data model. We're here to share the motivations behind this work and the strategies we use to successfully complete the migration. 
Our focus today is on the rationale behind the strategies rather than any implementation details. Um, so to start, let me say more about SDR and the challenges that drove the migration. Launched in 2006, SDR is a set of applications, systems, and services that house the digital collections of Stanford libraries, including Google Scan books, digitized images, research deposited by Stanford scholars, including electronic theses and dissertations, rare medieval manuscripts, and much, much more. SDR is thus a repository service spanning many systems and data stores that holds a combination of digitized, born digital, and institutional repository content. Um, it now comprises more than 5 million heterogeneous digital objects, and until last year, they were stored in a Fedora Commons repository, specifically Fedora 3. From 2009 to last year, SDR relied specifically on Fedora 3 as a data store for uh, digital objects. Fedora 3 was a real workhorse for us for 13 years, despite a number of misalignments, including Fedora 3 was no longer supported. Its final release was in 2015. We were storing metadata in Fedora 3 as XML and validating none of it. Fedora 3 was designed to support was not designed to support transactions, so network outages resulted in malformed objects, and Fedora 3 did not support querying of arbitrary XML metadata. So for SDR, querying was provided by an external search service, which we needed to keep in sync with Fedora. In addition, the SDR application ecosystem itself suffered from critical shortcomings of our own making. Without the ability to validate metadata, Objects wound up highly inconsistent due to factors such as allowing users to manually edit metadata XML in our management app. Applications were tightly bound to Fedora, each one interacting directly with the repository to update and create objects. And applications took advantage of this flexibility to store application-specific metadata. So prior to the migration, SDR objects were handled via wildly inconsistent practices, resulting in a junk drawer type approach to metadata. These challenges motivated the migration to um, a new repository data store and a rich validatable data model for repository objects. We'll now cover eight key strategies for completing the migration without downtime or data loss. One of the crucial lessons we learned is that objects in our repository should be validatable, meaning that every object could be checked to ensure it conforms to the repository data model. In 2017 to 18, we developed a data model for repository objects known as Cosina. Cosina objects are serialized as JSON and the schema is represented as an open API specification. We selected open API as the underlying schema expression because it's widely adopted, has excellent tooling in multiple programming languages, and the specs can be used automatically by APIs to enforce data validation at the seams. So critical to integrating Cosina across SDR was having a library to provide Ruby classes for our Cosina objects so that they could be manipulated in Ruby code. These classes are created by a code generator in a Ruby gem called Cosina Models. We built the generator to transform our open API schema into Ruby models. So as changes are made to the Cosina data model, the open API spec is modified and new Ruby models are generated, which we then deploy across all of SDR. The crux of this approach is that when a Cosina object is created or updated, it's validated against the same schema that's enforced across all of SDR. Thus, objects are validated both at the code level within systems and at the API level across systems. And in both cases, the validation is performed using the same mechanism and the same rule set. To address tight coupling between applications and the repository data store, what used to be Fedora 3, the new data store was abstracted behind an HTTP API. This API, known as Door Services App, or DSA, allows applications to create and retrieve and update Cosina objects. A focus of the migration was to refactor existing applications to use Cosina objects instead of Fedora objects and to interact with this DSA API instead of Fedora. So with DSA mediating interactions with repository objects, it was the key component ensuring that mapping between Fedora and Cosina objects produced faithful results. Prior to completing the migration, DSA performed a real-time two-way mapping 
between Cosina and Fedora objects, essentially providing a Cosina facade atop Fedora. Given the complexity of the data models and the substantial heterogeneity of SDR objects, the mapping code was very complex, and Justin will go into more detail on that soon. Once we decoupled our applications from Fedora, DSA was the only application writing directly to it. This allowed us to pursue a rolling migration strategy, which Justin will also cover soon. All the strategies we're covering required significant labor and time, and much of this work was totally invisible to end users. At the same time, none of our project work went away and needed continuous attention throughout the migration. So alongside the technical components of the migration, we needed a strategy to ensure migration work and project work could both proceed. Our team doesn't determine its own priorities or work plans. So with all the challenges we faced, we needed to make a strong case for, to leadership for spending significant time on migration. A series of conversations with leadership led to guiding principles for what we termed SDR evolution, which was a plan to chip away at migration work over a multi-year period. These guiding principles included that we needed to continuously deliver user-facing value uh, throughout the migration, meaning project work would have to continue during the migration. It couldn't just stop. And we would not be able to come in one day, flip off Fedora, turn on the new thing. Uh, we needed to evolve systems rather than replace them as we went. So with these principles, we worked with our supervisor to map map upcoming project work to SDR migration needs. As an example, we knew that our self-deposit application needed updating. And we knew that this was an opportunity too to advance the migration by placing an API scene between the app and the repository. So we negotiated with our stakeholders about how many migration needs could be included within the scope of our projects. Fortunately, since they were bullish on our strategy for chipping away at the migration, they understood the value of pairing their most wanted features with migration work. The migration from Fedora 3 to another data store would have been hindered without this strategy to use project time to subsidize migration work. The team was thus able to make progress on the migration while project work proceeded apace. Justin Littman will now describe the remaining five strategies. So as Mike mentioned, one of the problems that we had was a tight coupling, both at the service level and at the data level. Not surprisingly, we used a separation of concern strategy at both these levels to entangle things. So at the service level, we extracted services from the SDR monolith into their own applications. Each of these applications had their own API and data store. Now, we try to strike a balance here because you can extract microservices uh, forever. Um, but each of those services has an expense, especially in the Rails framework, to maintain. So we tried to find the right level to pull them out. And some of the services that we pulled out were the workflow service, an event service, and the technical metadata service. We also found ourselves doing the same thing at the data level, in which we had a data monolith, which was the Fedora object with its XML data streams, uh, that needed to be taken apart. Uh, and some of that data was put into separate data stores. Each of these data stores could store the data in the way that was most appropriate. And the win we got out of this is that uh, when stored appropriately, we could do things like query the data and do bulk updates. So for example, technical metadata was previously an XML data stream that was uh, unqueryable and inconsistent. And it was moved into a Postgres database within the technical metadata service where it can now be queried and updated. Next slide, please. So the next three strategies are all about our mappings. And before proceeding, I just want to emphasize why the mappings were so crucial and so complex. Mike already hit on this, but they were crucial because we were isolating Fedora from the rest of SDR. The rest of SDR spoke Cosina JSON, but this was persisted as Fedora XML. This required a two-way or round-trip mapping between the two formats. Now, again, as Mike alluded to, this data, uh, regardless of the format, was highly complex. And the data was highly variant, what might called a metadata junk drawer. So our first strategy, next slide, please, was to templatize our unit test. Uh, because of the mapping, we had a huge number of unit tests. And creating and managing these tests was proving to be very inefficient because the metadata analyst was creating and maintaining tests outside the code base, which would then have to be coded and implemented by a developer. And keeping the two in sync was a, a bit of a, was suboptimal. 
So to simplify this process and to allow us to adapt a test-driven rhythm, we templatize our unit test so that all the uh, tests required were some blocks of XML and JSON. You see an example here. So next slide, Mike. Uh, in addition to reducing the boilerplate, this allowed the metadata analyst to create and maintain the test and the developer to implement the mappings, uh, which greatly helped the process out. N next slide, please. Uh, so the next strategy is another testing strategy. Despite all these unit tests, we still had a mapping problem. And the reason we had a problem is because when we, at the time we were writing the mapping and the unit test, we didn't fully understand all of our data. Uh, and as a result, we would implement a mapping, put it in production, and there would be a cavalcade of bugs. So we had to take a different approach. And the approach that we took, next slide, was to test each mapping code change by round tripping it against a large number of real digital objects. So round tripping involved uh, taking a, a digital object, converting it from one format to another, the other format, and then back again, and comparing what you started with with what you ended up with. Uh, we did this in both directions. Uh, and when I say large number, I mean for a typical coding change, we would test it against at least 100,000 objects but we could test it up to millions depending on the nature of it. Next slide. There was more to this strategy as well. Uh, Fedora was slow. Uh, and so in order to scale this, we created a disk cache of Fedora data streams. There was extensive tooling around this because it's something we put a lot of time into. The result of this is that when we rolled out a mapping code change, we could be confident that it would successfully perform the mapping and wouldn't introduce bugs. Next slide. So the next strategy is also about our, our mappings. And that the problem that we had is that when the metadata analyst was trying to write the mappings, she didn't really understand all of the data that was there. Uh, unfortunately, Fedora wasn't queryable at the right level. And so uh, we used a strategy that took advantage of our disk cache of Fedora objects. And we created a, map, a reporting framework so that in response to a reporting request, the developer would write a little script that could be run in parallel over the cache. You can sort of think of it as a lightweight map reduced framework. The win here is that it allowed us to answer questions that otherwise weren't answerable, answerable and were crucial to our mapping. Next slide. Okay, the last uh, strategy I want to talk about is our rolling migration strategy. As Mike explained, we, it wasn't feasible to take SDR offline for migration. That is, users had to be able to do their jobs at all times. So we used a rolling migration strategy in which we ran Fedora and Postgres data stores at the same time. During this period of rolling migration, any new or updated digital objects would be saved to both data stores. And when it came to retrieving an object, we'd first try to retrieve it as Cosina from the Postgres database. But if it wasn't available, we'd fall back to reading it from Fedora and mapping it to Cosina. Uh, in addition, at the same time, there was a script that was backfilling any objects that had not yet been migrated. The real win of this approach is that we could perform migration over time without downtime or user impact. In fact, the users didn't even know a migration was going on in the background. It also gave us the opportunity to roll back if necessary. Uh, we could discard the Cosina and start over. So uh, next slide. Uh, so was this successful? Uh, the only hiccup we hit is that in a final bit of rage, Fedora crashed and refused to come back up. Uh, fortunately, we had a, a depth of experience on our team uh, that could bring it back up and we could successfully complete the migration. Uh, Fedora is no longer part of the SDR infrastructure. Thank you. All right, we uh, don't have time for questions right now. So we will move on. Uh, and the last one is a recorded talk from Dan Field. Worst case scenario hmm, turns out better than expected. The National Library of Wales Fedora migration strategy. Okay. Recording stopped. Sounds like it might be related to the last talk.
are we ready? Hit it. Good afternoon, Code Philip. My name is Dan Field, and I'm the Head of Software Development at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, United Kingdom. I'd like to introduce my talk this afternoon, entitled Worst Case Scenario Turns Out Better Than Expected. We'll take a brief look at the National Library and get a background on our situation with regards to our ageing Fedora 3 repository before looking at the solutions which helped us to migrate from Fedora 3 to Fedora 6. The National Library of Wales was established by Royal Charter on the 19th of March 1907 in Aberystwyth, Wales, United Kingdom. Several building extensions have taken place over the years, the most recent of which is a new major storage facility on the rear of the building in 1996, visible in the photo in front of you. More recently than that, the new Royal Charter was established in 2006. As you can see, the library contains a varied set of physical collections. In addition to the traditional documentary materials, we also have an ever-growing collection of audiovisual material. Currently sitting at about 1.5 petabytes, this is also expected to reach 4 petabytes within two years. Much of this content is from the library's archives of three Welsh television channels, which have been digitised. In addition to this, live television content is recorded off of the air via terrestrial digital video broadcast. Pre-2005, our METS documents were handcrafted by a team of digital metadata specialists. The documents were managed and rendered by an Apache Cocoon, Cocoon server, which was built in-house. In 2005, VTLS Vital was procured by the library as part of a larger catalogue product. This is built on Fedora, and I think at the time it was version 2. In 2013, the infrastructure was upgraded, and the software and hardware stack was moved from physical servers to VMware virtual machines, and we added load balancing elements to our front-end web delivery elements, as well as ditching Vital in flavor of a vanilla Fedora. This was now onto version 3. The library's digital collections can roughly be categorised by these material types. Newspaper pages, journal pages, wills, maps, manuscripts, photographs, archives and audiovisual material. All in all, Fedora is currently home to around 5.5 million objects, which span over 30 different object models. Many of these models are ripe for modernization and normalization, though, and we hope to reduce this number considerably to, more than, to no more than maybe five models. We don't heavily utilize disseminators anymore. Most material is ingested as a in a master archival format, like a TIFF image and then accompanying web delivery image, usually a JPEG 2000. Storage is always a concern when preserving digital objects. We currently stand at about 300 gigabytes of FoxML documents, which contain inline METS, Dublin Core, MIX, Premise, and other common meta XML metadata standards. Our data streams are split between 15 terabytes of managed data streams and seven terabytes of data streams living in an external to Fedora within our tape library. With Fedora 3.8 having been end of life for some time now, it was imperative that we move to a supported product. As it stands, we are unable to comply with our cybersecurity guidelines. The underlying tech stack has not changed much since that of 2013 other than the operating system upgrades and package version upgrades within our usual ongoing cycles. We need to work smarter within the current climate. 
whilst once we might have strived to collect the very best and most detailed metadata about every single object and action within the digitization and preservation process, we no longer have the resource to support such work. We need to be simplifying the objects we store and standardizing the models and formats across the entire repository in order for us to continue to preserve our data at the rate that it is being generated. The library has seen its overall staff numbers depleted by a third since the glory days of our mass digitization programs during more affluent times. Ultimately, we believe we no longer had the staff capacity to continue maintaining our existing Fedora 3 systems. However, we also feared that we didn't have the capacity to migrate such a behemoth of a system with so few people, and with those people being core to so many other priority projects which were currently underway. We decided that we needed help. We reached out to Lyricis. They are now the organisational home of Fedora, alongside the other DuraSpace-sponsored projects. We had worked with them during a recent Fedora camp, as well as following their outputs in workshops and talks of many years on the conference circuits. We inquired as to the availability of support and consultancy. However, during this exchange, we started doing some research of our own. We discovered that the Fedora project was delivering two grant-funded projects that could really be of use to us. Firstly, the Migration Utils Package, a single command-line tool which takes your existing Fedora 3 data store and generates a Fedora 6 compliant OCFL file system, effectively running the entire migration from a single command. The other deliverable was as yet unreleased, but is available as of this month. The Fedora Migration Paths and Tools documentation suite, which is now live on the Fedora Wiki. We decided to trial the migration utils on a small subset of our data. We generated a list of PIDs that we wanted to migrate, choosing a few from each model type to get an idea of how each model looked in Fedora 6. We ran migration utils and pointed at our legacy objects and data streams on disk, as well as providing an output location for the OCFL file system, and waited. It took roughly a day to migrate 100,000 objects, and another few hours to index them on the first run of Fedora 6. OCFL, or the Oxford Common File Layout, is a repos repository agnostic, human-readable specification on the layout of files for digital preservation purposes underlying a repository. The idea being that you could take your files from under one repository and stand up an entirely different OCFL-compliant repository or piece of software upon them. The only downside being the JSON metadata files and file system nature of the beast not being that performant on their own, hence the indexing process which Fedora performs on first seeing a new OCFL file system. Relational database indexes are created on the JSON metadata and file system paths for faster querying and data retrieval. We noted some failures and realized that one of them was down to a bug in the migration tool which we supplied a patch for that has since been rolled into the latest version of the tool. We have since performed a migration against the entirety of our Fedora 3 data streams and objects, the resulting storage taking up around 15 terabytes of space. Again, not all of our objects successfully migrated. The tool found some bugs in our own data, some of which we are fixing with scripts pre-migration. Incidentally, this migration took around about 18 days and the subsequent indexing was around 4 days. We're still in the middle of this migration work, but we have realised that we can easily achieve this on our own with our limited resources thanks to the excellent tools and documentation provided by the IMLS grant outputs. I'll leave you with a brief image of one of our objects from our data test migration, here shown in the Fedora 6 interface with the various properties as migrated without any additional work. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.
I don't know. Do we have any channel for questions? I don't think so. Right? Excuse me. Are, are, the, are the the authors on the Slack? I don't know if he is, but I'm guessing that would be the place to put them is Slack. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right then. Well, guess what? We have gotten to the end of our program for the day. And now I get to do the first day wrap up. All right, so first of all, uh, looking forward to tonight. Uh, our, our, uh, our community support volunteers for tonight's reception will be uh, black and white lanterns, and that's Andromeda, and Bobby, Bobby's there, and Esme, we're going to have fun, okay. What else? All right. Is there any, I mean, social events are an important part of Code for Lib, are there, is, does anyone have any announcements related to social events? All right. Well, um, I am organizing a run tomorrow morning at 7 down on the Delaware and Merton Canal towpath. It's one of the most beautiful, pleasant runs in New Jersey. And um, I will be meeting at the Alexander Road parking lot. And anyone who wants to come can walk it, run it, three miles, less, more. Uh, it'll be fun. And uh, if you are on the live stream, you can join us by joining the Code for Lib Club on Strava. And just do your run, and, and you can see everyone else. Check it out. All right. Um, reception logistics. All right, the reception is at Palmer House. Uh, it's not really on campus. It's across Nassau Street. It's like, I mean, as, as a Princetonian, Nassau Street defines campus and not campus for me. It's on the other side of Nassau Street. Um, and it, the entrance is right on, right at the end towards where it turns into 206, um, <clears throat> between Bank Street and Mercer Street. And the note here says the entrance is easy to miss, but it will have a code for live yard sign next to it. Uh, attendees must arrange for their own transportation to the venue. You can find transit directions on the venues page of the conference website. Uh, if you're like me, uh, I'm going to be going off and checking into my hotel and getting a uh, a ride share to the to the uh, to the reception. So I encourage everyone to like you know if if you're doing that, post on on the Slack channel, uh, and maybe you can get a share, a ride share, hey. All right, uh, your name, oh, it says no badge or name tag will be required for the reception because it's like a secret reception and like there aren't any students on campus to crash it. All right, important, if you are giving a talk tomorrow morning, please arrive between 8 and 8.45 to load your presentation onto the Podium computer before the disk on it gets all deleted. OK, and don't forget your badge or lanyard tomorrow morning because you will need it. And that's all for the announcements. All we have left to do is to give a big round of applause for our organizers, for our volunteers, and our speakers. And see you at the reception. <laughs>